Broadcasting your inclusion journey online, 18th to the 26th of November. You're listening to Reba Radio. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramroop. I'm the Director of Inclusion here at the RIBA. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in the foundational behavioral principle of CQ, cultural intelligence. We're talking fear, we're talking data, we're talking motivation, we're talking CQ drive. Welcome to day two of Reba Radio. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramroop, the Director of Inclusion here. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in that foundational behavioural principle of CQ, cultural intelligence. Yesterday, we heard from Dr. David Livermore of the Cultural Intelligence Centre, talking about about what is CQ and Dr. Pragya Agawal about unconscious bias and Yemi Aludaran and Miriam al uh, the RIBA committee members about the inclusion charter and Samita Singer, OBE, Tom Guy and Wiwa Oki about inclusion in architecture up till now. If you've missed it, don't worry, you've not missed it. It's all on Reba's YouTube channel as soon as we can possibly get it there and you can hear it again online on that YouTube channel. We'll also be making the content into podcasts. Coming up today, we're talking about CQ Drive, your level of persistence and confidence when working and relating with those different from you. It's a biggie and it's an often, often overlooked capacity. Uh, but after that will be after today's... Shock Stats. Uh, every day we'll be starting with some statistics to get you going and today from the fame collective they say uh, from part one to part three in your architectural education you'll see that all of the minority groups drop out of architecture education for example asian students at part one comprise about 6.8 percent of the intake but only 1.5 percent at part three that's a massive drop off but on the flip side, according to Deloitte, organisations with inclusive cultures are six times more likely to be innovative. There's something to bear in mind. Before we get stuck in today, I have to tell you this story. Uh, yesterday, we were speaking to Dr. Pragya Agarwal about unconscious bias, and she's written several books about various aspects of discrimination, women and race too. But her book, Sway, Unraveling Unconscious Bias, was what we concentrated on. And, you know, we've had a number of different conversations uh, in different ways over the time that we've been connected, uh, including just before the interview that I did with her. And she mentioned that she was aware of you know architectural education pattern in parts one two and three and so on because she'd worked at UCL and she'd uh, had a lot of contact with the Bartlett and I can't remember why that came up but we were talking about it but at no point did she ever mention uh, that she had an architecture degree uh, so it was a big surprise to me yesterday when she mentioned it on air um, she revealed it live uh, so the, her first degree was in architecture, but she only got it because her friend who was passionate about architecture said to her, oh, come along with me uh, to the entrance exam um, for this architecture degree course, will you? You know, for moral support. Now, who sits an entrance exam for a university course for fun? Like, who ever does that? Uh, but she did because um, she's an incredibly bright woman. Anyway, she, she went along, uh, she, she uh, is subscribed and, and she sat the exam too, and she got in. Um, she said it was it was really interesting because it pulled together her love of the arts and, and, um, and the sciences as, as well. So last night I'm on the train, I'm on the train home and I, 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 I tweet about having this conversation with her and the fact that she did this degree. And I tweeted, I, you know, wondered how her friend was getting on with their architectural career. The punchline of the story, uh, which we didn't get to on air, her friend didn't even get onto the course. 
that she she accompanied them. So you must listen back to that interview with that new information. Uh, she went along with her friend for moral support and uh, possibly took their place away from them on the course. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to get stuck straight in this morning talking CQ Drive. A reminder that CQ is made up of four key components, CQ Drive, CQ Knowledge, CQ Strategy and CQ Action. And when you have all four, you will be successful at inclusion efforts. It's proven. Uh, CQ Drive is made up of three parts. Intrinsic interest, which is the enjoyment that you inherently derive from working and relating with those different from you. Extrinsic interest is about the rewards, awards or fear of punishment that may drive you to work and relate with those different from you. And self-efficacy is about confidence and pushing through when it gets tough. Uh, we all make mistakes. I mean, we're human, right? We all make mistakes, especially, you know, when we're thinking about working, relating with those with different backgrounds. There's no doubt that doing this, the fear of, of getting it wrong can really stop us in our Tracks, you know, even before we get started. So to talk about this, I'm joined by Hamza Sheikh, who's an architectural assistant and podcaster, and um, uh, Jason Boyle, a fellow of the RIBA and creator of the Global Architect Alliance. And if I can start by asking you, Hamza, uh, to introduce yourself in the way that you like to be introduced. Um, I always think this, this is worth doing. And tell us, if you can, your experience of the biggest diversity and inclusion mistake that you can think of. Uh, something either that happened to you or something that you've done yourself, if you're willing to admit to it. So. Well, yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, introduction, I guess it's a difficult one. I've always struggled with actually defining what I do one, because I'm still quite junior in the field and two, because I do so many other things outside of it. So I guess you, I'm happy with architectural designer and podcaster, to be honest. Um, I think, I guess trying to think of where I might have got it wrong or where, where I've experienced that is, is a difficult one. I, I personally am someone who, who in some ways, even though, you know, I have my own groups that I fit into with minority backgrounds, I feel kind of privileged in in some ways because I don't feel like I have uh, kind of been mistreated or been uh, you know oppressed or exploited based on my identity. Um, however, I think that that kind of raises a bigger question about uh, you know intersectionality. But I'm sure we could get into that later. But to be honest, I, I think it's usually happening on a much more subliminal level, and it's difficult to really analyze what is being done and to what with what intent something's being done. So the honest truth is I don't know and I've, and I've kind of struggled with it myself. Thank you, thank you for your honesty there, Hamza. Um, Jason, tell me about, describe yourself and uh, what what's your biggest diversity and inclusion mistake? Yes, absolutely, and, and this is fantastic and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Jason Boyle, so I'm an architect who works in the nuclear industry and so I, essentially I designed, for, well, for the past 13 years, I've designed nuclear buildings, but I also um, am quite passionate about um, social media and the, uh, the power of social media that can, you know, that can be harnessed with, you know, with architects. So I set up the Global Architect Alliance, and this relates, I think, to the topic I want to kind of talk about, my worst mistake. So it was in the early days when I set up the Global Architect Alliance on um, a platform called Clubhouse. And um, I was quite enthusiastic at the start and I was doing rooms almost daily. And I thought it was a great idea to talk, get a room and talk about my favorite um, architect. What is everyone's favorite architect? And so me not thinking, doing things, I think a little bit too quickly, I went and searched for um, a picture, an image of architects on Google. I picked the first picture happened to be all white male um, elderly architects and um, most of them I think were deceased by now and put that up on social media and um, yeah I, I got um, a lot of um, backlash on Twitter and, and for that and I apologized I took it down and um, I kind of ever since then I've really thought hard about you know um, who speaks the panels that we have the topics we discuss and try and um, get a really uh, diverse panel. 
So that, that, that was probably my worst mistake and that happened this year. And we're also joined by Paul Zara, the architect, um, uh, who, uh, if I can get you, Paul, to introduce yourself. And uh, is, what, how would you describe uh, the biggest uh, diversity inclusion mistake that you might have been involved with? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I, yeah, I'm Paul Zara. I chair um, RIBA Sussex uh, and I have worked at Conran and Partners for about 25 years. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the biggest, the biggest mistake I make. I think the biggest mistake I've made over the years, which I very much try and correct now, is, um, is kind of bias when you're kind of looking at CVs, um, where you just make assumptions about people from, from a name, from a, you know, from the from a background, I'm, I'm very careful to kind of um, yeah, very careful to kind of now. Well, what I'd really like to do is do what universities do and actually take off all that data. So you're judging people alone on their work, um, but it's something that I kind of I think I was I think it was you know subconscious bias. I think it's something that is still very much around. Thank you. Thanks for, for all of you for your, for your honesty there. Um, if I can go to you, Jason, and ask you, what did it feel like initially when, when you know, your mistake was pointed out to you? Yeah, I, th I think if anyone's uh, attacked on social media, I've got a I think I've got a pretty hard skin having been, you know, um, having been on social media a long time. But I did feel at first, my first reaction was, oh, Oh, I, I, I made a genuine mistake, and I, you know, I, I felt quite hurt in a way. But then I reflected very quickly and said, "No." When I, I really looked at the post, I can see um, definitely there's problems with this, and so I, I apologized. I took it down and I swapped the picture out for a, you know, um, a much more kind of di di diverse, um, you know, group of architects, male, female, etc. Um, so yeah, initial initially I was kind of hurt, but very quickly I realised that that was it was my mistake. Yeah. And and Paul, do you know, when when you has has anyone sort of pointed out your mistakes to you, and how has that felt for you? Have we lost Paul? Oh, no, no, I'm no, still, still there. Still there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think it's really been pointed out particularly, but um, I just think that. You know, I'm, I think I'm pretty older than everybody else. I've been around a, a long time and I've actually spent too much time, yeah, just surrounded by white male architects. And it's sort of a, although I haven't said that, you know, we, we, when the, when the um, building design 50-50 campaign came out a few years back, we were the second firm to join it, trying to get 50% uh, female, you know, uh, female representation in the studio. So, that, you know, I, yeah, so I, I've done what I kind of, I've done what I can over the years. That that um, uh, element of like having it, having did you need to have it pointed out to you though that you maybe needed to have fifty percent women? What, what would have stopped you before that from doing that? Um, well, I think it's I think it's just the natural number of candidates that are around. I mean, it was sort of uh, it's that thing that we all know about, which is you know that at the moment. At the start of a part one course, it's probably 50 50 um, male, female, um, sometimes even better than that in terms of the percentage of women. And then as you get to part two and part three and into practice, that, that drops off very rapidly. Now, Hamza, um, you, uh, I think one of the things that we, we've talked about, and you're, you're very much on social media as well, is that sense that sometimes when you get it wrong, you get cancelled. <laughs> My daughter was talking to tell me back. Cancel 2021 hashtag, and um, you know it's it's a thing right now. You get it wrong. You say right, that person's out of my life. They don't deserve to be in my bubble. I mean, how do you feel about it? You think that's the right thing to do? I think it can be a natural reaction. I think social media algorithms can play into that and exacerbate it and feed into it. Um, it's it's hard to kind of define where it goes, where it where it where it goes where it goes wrong sometimes. But I think cancel culture can go wrong when it becomes mob mentality, and I think especially when people don't get a right to defend themselves, don't get a right to really explain the, the deeper aspects of the situation. That's when I think people should really take a second guess as to you know whether they're retweeting something or whether they're 
uh, going to make a, a you know a, a post about someone a personal attack it's just like you know do you know all the evidences do you know the entire situation and i think deeper than that do you know their perspective because you know i think one thing people don't really talk about enough is inclusivity include includes every single person it's not just marginalized groups but it's also you know every group the majority groups that are in the country the context everybody's voice needs to be heard well, that's quite a controversial point of view in from some respects from a from a, a, a person of colour point of view, but we're going to explore that. Coming up later, we have some challenging, but hopefully really insightful conversation about discomfort and white shame uh, with the US-based anti-racist consultant Robin Schlenger. And she'll be alongside the architect Jim Rooney and Open City founder Phineas Harper. Uh, Robin's been doing some great work alongside Dr Alana Tappin on shame resilience for white people and it really should be a very crucial and vital piece of listening for anyone who wants to get over that discomfort of talking about race but also understand what is that defensiveness when you think rightly or wrongly you're being accused of racism and yesterday we heard from Dr David Livermore of the Cultural Intelligence Centre talking about what is CQ and the full video of that hour-long conversation is on Reba's YouTube channel subtitled uh, and uh, we'll be repeating today's and yesterday's Today's content on this listen link over the weekend. Right now, we're talking CQ Drive, getting it wrong, feeling the fear, doing it anyway. And we're with Hamza Sheikh, Jason Boyle and Paul Zara. And just before um, we had that wonderful interlude uh, from uh, Taylor Swift uh, shaking it off uh, from the Hate Hate Haters, uh, we were talking about cancel culture. And the fact that actually um, what you were saying, Hamza, there was that in inclusivity really is about everybody having their say, even if it might feel like a bit hatey. <laughs> Would um, you say that? I mean, do you think there's ever a place for, for cancelling someone? No, definitely. I mean, I didn't say people should be talking about, you know, talking in derogatory ways and, and, and speaking hatefully. No way. What I mean by making sure everyone's views are heard and that everyone's included is that just the dialogue is open up to everyone. Um, without dialogue, without you know getting to the root of these issues, these these things are going to keep going on. And I think we've been talking about inclusivity for for, for ages, for decades, and we, we, we we'll, we'll keep talking about it unless the dialogue gets better. So. Yeah, I think everybody's opinions should be heard, even if you're really uncomfortable hearing someone's opinions. You need to have that conversation. Um, Paul, uh, do you, do you, what do you think the consequences are, though, of, of getting it wrong publicly? Um, well, I think I think architecture just is just still accused of being a kind of white male profession. It's just sort of and that's changing. That is a so fact, so though, isn't it, Paul? That it is a white male. Absolutely. The facts, it's so slow. You know, I collect architecture books and I've got books like this one from 19, I don't even see it, from the 1960s. Well, what's it called? Go on, I can't see uh, it. Called Your Architect. And it's kind of, it's it's all written in the mail. It's all like him and he and, yeah, and it's, and it, so that's from the 1960s. And I don't think it's very different now. And I just, uh, and especially if, if, you know, especially you go onto construction sites. You know, I think construction is even further behind. I know they're trying to do things about it. But if you go onto a building site, it's generally white male, um, 90%, I'd say. And we've got a long, long way to go. And I just don't think there's enough being done at all by, by the schools. And it's got to start with the schools. But in terms of like making that mistake, you know, publicly and, and, and trying to correct these things, I mean, that, that book from the 1960s, do you think there's any excuse for a book like that coming out today? I think it could be completely rewritten, yeah, completely rewritten, because this is, yeah, those books have... Uh, is know, that a fundamental text that's still being used in... No, it's not. No, 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 it's a very random text, but it's sort of, but I've got a few of them from the sort of 50s, 60s, and it's always pictures of, of white men in suits standing around a table pointing at a model of an art, you know, and it's sort of, I mean, it's, it is changing. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're doing a talk down here in um, Brighton next week by Elizabeth Darling, who's doing a talk on kind of um, those kind of hidden architects, um, female architects, gay architects from the, from the 1930s and 40s who were out there doing that work, but nobody knew who they were. And I know, I know some of that stuff's coming out with the people that, like Charlotte Perrion, people who work with Corbusier, but it's sort of, 
you have to drag it out of architectural history. It's not there. It's you, know, you have to go hunting. Yeah, it's really, really important. We're going to be talking about architectural history um, next week with Neil uh, Chassel, um as well. So, uh, you know, that kind of speaks to the point, Jason, about, you know, making sure those pictures are right uh, in terms of representation and, and so on. So, you know, in, in, term, in, in your experience, you know, what is, apart from, you know, the, the, the issue with your, um, your clubhouse, what do you think the, the consequences are of, of getting it wrong publicly? Uh, it, it, it can it could be terrible i mean it really if if um you know i guess if i'd have took the other option of um you know just just saying no i i agree with that and um you know it it, it, it could it could affect your career it could affect your progression it could um you know alienate you and um you know that 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 that's that is um a, a high possibility i think in in this day and age with them um, social media and especially if you you know if you've got quite a large presence on social media you know that could that could definitely be an impact i would think so it'd be key... interesting to see what hamza would say you know, yeah because i mean yeah. certainly hamza i think the, the key thing is is how jason handled that mistake that was the difference between i suppose him being cancelled and not being cancelled yeah and i think uh, I'm, I'm i'm not a stranger to to kind of slightly controversial views if you like and maybe i've got a license to do that in some ways given that i come from marginalized backgrounds but i don't know i think i really emphasize dialogue and getting to the root of the issues and you know jason <clears throat> sorry jason rightfully you know felt that he was probably going to come under attack and and then decided to act out of um you know act out of fear and and, and kind of fix the situation but you know personally I would have liked to hear the reasons, maybe the the reasons that maybe aren't at the forefront of his mind or the forefront of people's mind as to why they make those decisions or make any decisions they make. And maybe there could have been a um, maybe a clubhouse session to say, well, actually, let's talk about it. And I know Jason has done these things, so you know, kudos to him for for opening up all sorts of conversations. Um, but but I would have said, you know, don't don't kind of run away and put a rock over your head and hide and say don't attack me don't kill me and to the people who are throwing stones to, to, to tell them to chill and say look why don't we all talk about and figure out what why this is actually happening and then maybe the reasons could actually surface instead of people getting scared running away and then the mob continues really really good point because actually um if we if we, if we may use this example jason just because it's such a good one about how okay you 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 really quickly went on google looked up some image just ask for arch images of architects uh the images that came up were images mm. of white yes. men and actually uh up until 2017 if you googled the word beauty the images on google that came up were all of white women and um, it's something that they've worked on their algorithm now to change that. So you get lots of different ideas of what beauty is when you Google uh, Google, and 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 I presumably there are men in there as well uh, uh, because you know that's uh, what changed. So there's something about those algorithms uh, in terms of you know we were talking yesterday about uh, with Pragya Agwal about uh, bias in AI and the fact that this can actually um, uh, create and reinforce the bias uh, that exists for patriarchy in our society. Uh, so. You know that that point that Pam, Hamza makes there. Excuse me, <coughs> we've all got frogs in our throats <laughs> today. Um, yeah, uh, you know that uh, that that uh, being able to examine. Okay, how did we get to this point where that's what happened in the first place? And it's a really really useful question to really examine. Okay, why do we get it wrong? How did we get to this place? And and dig deep into that. Um, and and so you know, uh, Paul, would you would you say that? That, that fear of getting it wrong, it, it can stop people from even trying. How do you even get over something like that? I think, I think it's just, like I said, I think it starts with the, um, <clears throat> starts with the schools, the architecture schools. And if you look at the way universities work, and they use the kind of indices of um, multiple deprivation, they use that thing called Polar 4. They look at, you know, postcodes of where people, the applicants come from. They look at um, the schools and the kind of... Uh, performance of the schools and they need to start doing some radical things they need to start lowering the grades for certain areas they need to start some 
you know, actually paying some sort of funding to funding some students, get, getting them into the profession so that so that the kind of default position isn't white male or white female. It's sort of much more diverse. So the so the pot that you're choosing from when you're getting, looking at CVs is uh, is much much more diverse. But it needs to be. There's so much more to be done. There is a there is a, a suggestion there though, um, Paul, that when you say the grades need to be lowered, that somehow underrepresented groups aren't good enough that they need to to have their grades lowered. That isn't quite true though, is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not true at all. And there was a kind of um, oh, I haven't got it here, but there was a kind of a similar talk about diversity at Central St Martins last week, and um, there were people making that point that yeah, just don't assume that because people are from those socio economic groups that they're that they're not good enough or they're not intelligent enough. It's just that they haven't had the opportunities. That I think. <laughs> That, well, like I say, when I got to the Bartlett in the 1980s, <laughs> I was shocked because I was I was two out I was one of two out of 50, maybe three out of 50 that went hadn't been to, in private education, and they were and then yeah and out of that 50 people there were two people that weren't white male or female and it's it's so undiverse and it's it's getting better now but it just sort of you just need to make that. You know, just make, you need to normalise, you know, a much more diverse, um, yeah, first year at university. I, th I think there's also to, to pause the fence there as well that you know, uh, the reason people sometimes end up with these <clears throat> really surface level solutions like, you know, just lower the grade is because they're not going deeper. They're not going to that level of saying, okay, it's 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 more than just an a conversation about race. It's more than just a conversation about how much money they have. And this is why I really like the discourse on intersectionality, which is saying you've got to look at so many other factors. Class plays a role, language plays a role. So, you know, this is again why I emphasize that we, we can't be kind of judging each other. We've got to let the conversation be relaxed, let this space be safe and let everyone talk and get to the bottom of it. Really in interesting point again, uh, Hamza, about about safety and and Jason. Do you feel safe to make mistakes? Um, I, I think um, I, I try and minimise some mistakes, but it is a very good question. Um, you know, because I think if you if you do have a presence on social media, you've got a high percentage chance of actually making mistakes. Um, I, I I don't feel. Um, I will be honest, I don't feel um, scared of that anymore. I think that if um, if someone was to um, highlight a mistake, I would look at it, I would ask opinions of other people and 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 correct that mistake. You know, absolutely. I think we're, we're none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. And I think that's one reason why I've um, really pushed this um, clubhouse and the Global Architect Alliance. I mean, we've had 36 debates and people can come and talk about any subject that they want, um, you know, and, and that's a great thing because I think a lot of people online hide behind the tech side of things. I think that's a thing I would like to talk about. And then when you actually get them in the room and you're talking to them, not face to face, but you, you actually can hear their voice, that is really powerful. And that is where change can be made. You know, um, I think it's very easy to fire things out on social media and hide behind that sort of text, that language. We're talking CQ Drive, getting it wrong with Hamza Sheikh, Jason Boyle and Paul Zara. Later on, we have got a completely amazing hour for you. Not that. Not all of all of the hours are amazing, of course, but uh, we're talking motivation, how to intrinsically motivate yourselves and get some, uh, you know, get yourselves motivated with some motivated and motivational people. Uh, Majid Majid is a Somali British activist and politician who served as the Lord Mayor of Sheffield in uh, uh, 2018 to 2019. And you may remember uh, his appointment attracted significant media attention because he was the first ethnic Somali and the youngest ever and the first Green Party councillor to hold the role. And his personal story of persistence is, is one we can all learn from. And his book is available uh, at the um, Reba bookshop as well. I've got it behind me. 
um, The Art of Disruption. So that'll be quite interesting to listen to him. We've got Tom Young, who won the uh, gold medal in the men, uh, men's 100 metres T38 event at the Tokyo Paralympics. And we have Sammy Kinghall, the multi-gold medal uh, winning wheelchair athlete as well. Um, all coming up talking about motivation. It sounds to me like that's going to be a pretty motivational hour. Uh, we're live here between nine and one every day, but you can listen at any other time uh, to hear the day's content repeated. So you needn't miss anything. We're also making videos available subtitled on Reba's YouTube channel. Right now, we're talking CQ Drive, getting it wrong with Hamza Sheikh, Jason Boyle and Paul Zara. And Hamza, I asked that question. Um, do you, you know, d does Jason feel psychologically safe to, to make mistakes? And, and, and I saw you have a little shake of the head there. You, d you didn't think it is, uh, it is safe for people to make mistakes. No, I think, I mean, my personal view is I've, I've seen, and again, this is just, I think the privilege I've got of being part of these marginalized identities. I've seen people in my own communities in my own ethnic groups, if you like, being, being discriminatory. And I think that there's, you know, that's why I come with this opinion that, you know, this is a conversation for everyone. There's room for everyone to improve in. Um, you know, we talk about privilege and again, I bring up intersectionality because as a, as a, as a male from South Asian background, a British male, I, I feel like I've got certain privileges. Um, so I think, yeah, I think at the moment the climate is, is, is not as forgiving as I think it should be. And, um, I think it's things like this. I think the reason I do a long form podcast as well is so, is so that I can give people a place to really explain stuff, really speak their opinions, and there's not going to be any judgment. Is, is there a sense, though, that if you have power, that you should take more responsibility and that maybe underrepresented groups don't have that power in quite the same way? I have a very strange relationship with power. Because, Talk to me. Uh, growing up, I was always, always kind of instilled with the power I have. And I was raised with incredible motivation and, and empowerment from my parents. And so I never relied on asking for power or telling people to give me power. And I made sure that I took every opportunity I could. I made sure to make as many opportunities as I could for myself. So I, I, I don't know if I can speak for, you know, for these higher institutional systematic changes because it, it, it's a bit out of my kind of, uh, you know, mental game. But what I can say about power and empowerment is I, f I feel like if everybody was motivated and, and, and felt that they had the power within themselves to make change, then I think that's where the real change happens. It's really, really interesting. My personal story is yeah. one of feeling very similar to yours and feeling that power stripped away because it, because of discrimination. And so, and then coming through that with a great deal of support to be able to use my personal journey to be able to give a voice to others. But so yeah. I just want to say one thing about yeah. that as well. Is I recognize as well that I'm young. I haven't experienced everything yet. Um, you know, just recently I've gone through some really challenging things and I'm trying to make sense of it myself. So I guess in, in the subliminal kind of lines there as well is, is that I'm also thinking where maybe I might get it wrong, but I'm also open to learning and I think everyone needs to be a bit more forgiving. Yeah, forgiveness really important. Um, you know, seeing Jason nod his head there, forgiveness important when when we do get it wrong because we all get it. Wrong. I know I get it wrong all the time. I've, I've I've developed a very strong muscle around saying sorry. Do do we know why sorry still seems to be the hardest word? We're not playing Elton John. <laughs> uh, I was tempted. Why is sorry still the hardest word, Jason? Um, that, that, again, it's, it's a pretty good, it's, it's a really good question, but I think, um, it's a pride, isn't it? Maybe it's about ego. Um, so, you know, you don't, it's, it, it can be hard to admit that you're wrong. Um, but you know, what Hamza said is absolutely right. Um, you know, I, that, that, that's where I think it comes from, you know, the pride and the ego. And I think a lot of architects, um, uh, have, um, a certain um, amount of ego and, and that's something maybe we, it's, it's a different topic for debate 
um, yeah, that can be why. I don't know what Paul Paul thinks. But sorry, also, but also just not knowing the reasons, right, Jason? Like mm, fundamentally, yeah, yeah. we can be so quick to react that we don't actually get to the bottom of why you should apologize or what there is to actually apologize for. So I think you're right, but I think also it's just people don't know the, the reasons as well. It's a really interesting point that, you know, Pragya was making yesterday uh, when talking about um, unconscious bias that, um, you know, even if you come from an underrepresented group, uh, that you are, can still be because of your socialization, because of the inferential messages that you've grown up with, because of all the impacts and, and, and things that you, you were shortcutting, you know, go back to that Timothy Wilson, you are, uh, you, your brain is processing 11 million bits of information at any given time. You have the conscious capacity to process 40. And so at any given moment, you have 10 million, 999,960 bits of information your brain is shortcutting all the time and that's the root of bias and we're not even aware of this um there was a horizon a couple of years ago a couple a, a two-part horizon about how we make decisions uh it's based on daniel kahneman's um thinking fast and slow and uh the, some of the ways that our brain processes that you just wouldn't even you don't believe that you don't have the conscious capacity to to, to process and to to be aware of these things and yet we still behave it's who we think we are is that consciousness uh, that's behind us and so being able to recognize that and stop the only way that you can manage is by stopping and thinking and really doing that deep dive and being open to it absolutely i mean you know jason you're nodding away there uh, again what are your thoughts yeah I, I, again I, I i keep taking it back to to clubhouse because it is where you can have them conversations that I, I just feel that it, it's very hard with, you know, using text language on, on the example, like Twitter or Instagram, <clears throat> you know, it, it really isn't a debate. It, it, it looks like it's a debate, but it really isn't. And that's why I think if you can get people in a room, everyone can hear what everyone's talking about. You can have them discussions. Um, and, and I've, I've held some quite controversial, you know, debates and there's been some arguments where, um, I've had to almost break up these, these, these arguments and get people to, you know, even mute people to, 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 so the other person could speak and then unmute the other person, you know, so, and that's, that's why I'm really interested in, you know, what, what we're discussing today, because I'm learning as well. Well, certainly, Paul, I mean, that that sense of um, being able to have the conversation to yeah. open it up, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, I think going back to the sort of social media side of things, I think um, I mean, I've learned a lot through there, really, because I, I use LinkedIn and Twitter. And I, tend, I tend to use Twitter for fairly lightweight stuff and LinkedIn for sort of more business, business stuff. And, you know, I've had a few fallouts over the years on Twitter. And I've learned my lesson from that, well, you know, mainly with councillors and stuff like planning committee members. And, and in the end, it is that thing about saying sorry. I just sort of, a couple of times I've ended up saying that this is just getting silly. Let's go meet up and have a cup of coffee and we'll just sort this out. Because it, it can, it's, it can, as you say, it's not a conversation. Uh, you know, as Jason said, it's a kind of, it tends to be a sort of, can turn into an attack. And then you just have to kind of think, no, it's gone too far. Um, I can apologise on Twitter, but it's easier just to go and see the person and just say, no, sorry, that was just, we just got a bit carried away there. <laughs> And so at this point, I like to talk about um, that Moravian principle of communication, which is 55% of communication is body language, 38% is tone and 7% is the message itself. And so something uh, something that's written on Twitter technology, you know, whether it's an email, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, that's just the 7%. That's just the message. Picking up the phone, you get the, you get that extra 38%. You get the tone with which it's, it's intended. But there's nothing better than actually seeing and, and in these covid times it's been more difficult at least we've had some video calls but being able to sit down face to face and have yeah. some face to face conversations i think that's such a crucial point as well and i think because we're come, some of us are coming from the social media background um it's not just that but it's also the short form communication you're limited to whatever like 30 40 words on twitter you know what level of 
deep insight and conversation can you bring with Twitter? You can't, um, you know, same with uh, Instagram is everything's visual. You're going to really judge things on visual things. You, you know, this is why, again, you need conversation. You need long form conversation. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, people need to be wary that when they're on social media, when they're on these communication platforms, it's not the best place to have debates, not the best place to have meaningful engagement. So certainly, no, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, link, I think LinkedIn's even worse because, I mean, LinkedIn is just a big love fest. You know, really. Someone posts a project and you sometimes look at it and think, oh, that's awful. But you have, everyone writes, oh, well done, that's brilliant. I, mean, I once last year criticised some of these plans, they got planning consent, I criticised some of their plan layouts because they were just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> A, a, a loo opening right onto the dining table and it was sort of and i said oh well done you know you could have improved that the plans could be improved a bit and i got so much abuse from people not from the developer but well other people saying what well, you can't do that you can't criticize with the plans and i thought you can't even have a debate about it is that why i love linkedin so much because i get so much love on there <laughs> <laughs> that's why i love it who knew, paul, who knew paul would be a linkedin troll uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well look i think certainly that point about having the, the the way to sort of overcome getting it wrong may well be just that sense of stop sit down examine and have that longer conversation hamza yeah most definitely um i think I, so i had a discussion recently with charlie edmonds from uh, the future architects front so the latest episode of my podcast uh, episode 16 i believe and we talked about these things in depth and you know we mentioned this idea of you know if you're going to be on social media it's go everything's going to be surface level so if all the information you're getting about your politics about your knowledge to do with culture is all on social media it's bound to be it's bound to be limited so i think a side point I would make to this is if people really are interested, they need to seek platforms where they can get a longer and a more, you know, meaningful discussion on these things, um, like a podcast, maybe called Two Worlds Design. Oh, I sorry, don't I had to plug. Yeah, I'm of sorry. You could. <laughs> of course you did, answer. Brilliant. Look, uh, thank you so much. We've been talking CQ Drive, getting it wrong with Hamza Sheikh, Jason Boyle and Paul Zara. We're broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place. The police weren't coming to get Hamza, I promise. <laughs> uh, this isn't the last we've heard of Hamza today as he's joining us again between 5 and 6 p.m. having recorded one of our special My Soundtrack Hours. More details on that coming up later. If you're just tuning in and you'd like to catch up on what has been a really, really great conversation, you can do so. We're live between nine and one, but content will be repeated later. Just to keep you on track, CQ is a measure of cultural intelligence. Uh, cultural intelligence is the capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. CQ is made up of four key components, CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy, and CQ CQ action. When you have all four, you are likely to be successful in inclusion efforts. Uh, CQ Drive is made up of three parts. Intrinsic interest, which is the enjoyment that you inherently derive from working and relating with those different from you. Extrinsic interest is about the rewards and the awards or even like the fear of punishment that may drive you to work and relate with those who are different from you. And self-efficacy is about the confidence and pushing through when it gets tough. Coming up later, we're going to be talking about data because having data can really motivate people into action. It's one of those uh, reasons for the shock stats each day. Uh, and we'll be exploring how data can be used as well uh, in terms of a story uh, about what's going on. <laughs> Take a chance. Enter the Reba Radio Lucky Prize Draw. The Reba Radio Lucky Prize Draw. We have two fabulous prizes to give away because in that side that probably sounded a little bit scary <laughs> fabulous prizes they are fabulous prizes you could win a two night stay for you and a friend or lover in one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses uniquely designed these funky luxury retreats are fab things for pampering stay they've got hot tubs saunas 
cargo net day bed suspended above a stream beneath an oak canopy <laughs> and wood burning stoves if it's chilly as well um we can also win tickets to win to see the specials live at their show in Ju in uh, dublin uh, in july and a night in a hotel full terms and conditions can be found on architecture.com to enter the draw go to the reba radio webpage on architecture.com and just fill in the form the magic word you need is giraffe reba radio with Marsha Rebu. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramrip. I'm the Director of Inclusion here. We're bringing you an unbelievable 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do, and it's rooted in that foundational behavioural principle of CQ, cultural intelligence. Yesterday, we heard from Dr David Livermore of the Cultural Intelligence Centre talking about what is CQ and I will break that down again for you again later if you missed it. Dr Pragya Agarwal about unconscious bias, unbelievably having done her first degree in architecture we discovered yesterday and Yemi Aludaran and uh, Miriam al uh the Reba committee members about the inclusion charter and Samita Singer OBE, Tom Guy and we were Oki talking about inclusion, inclusion rather, in architecture up till now. If you've missed it, you've not missed it. It's all on Reba's YouTube channel and you can hear it again online here uh, over the weekend. We'll also be making the content into podcasts. We've also heard uh, from those in architecture about getting it wrong and dealing with fear. Next, we're talking discomfort and white shame. But first... Dish of the day. Hello, my name is Beatrice Fernandez and I'm a Part 1 Architecture graduate currently working with the RIBA. My dish of the day is a Brazilian black bean stew, also known as feijoada. With beans and rice at the heart of Brazilian food, this dish is perfectly spiced and flavoursome. If you want to kick up the spice levels, make sure you use plenty of red pepper flakes to season the dish. Pair it with rice, avocado and nachos for an indulgent and delicious meal. Enjoy! Oh, oh doesn't that sound good? Yes. Well, you know, talking about food is a really, really important part of uh, CQ Drive because being able to bond over food uh, is a really, really good way of getting to work and relate effectively with, with those who are different from you. But sometimes that can be uncomfortable and pushing through that is a really key part of being able to build your CQ Drive muscle. And we're going to be talking about that now with Robin Schlenger, Jim Rooney and Phineas Harper. I'm going to get you to introduce yourselves if I may. If I may stay, start with Robin, can you tell us a, a bit about yourself and what does anti-racism mean to you? Mm. Good morning. Uh, yes, hi. So um, my name is Robin Schlenker and for those of you um, who obviously can't see me, <laughs> I, I, did, I, use, I always identify letting folks know I use she, her pronouns and that I am white, cisgendered and able-bodied. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm gonna, Marsha, can you do me a favor? Cause I'm, I tend to ramble. So can you repeat what you'd like to hear? Especially since for me, it's five o'clock in the yes, morning. Yes, <laughs> it's 5 a.m. So thank you so much for joining us from the States. Um, so I'd like you to tell, tell me a bit about yourself and what does anti-racism mean to you? So you've described yourself, your white cisgendered able-bodied and you're probably a little bit tired. <laughs> and um, yeah, what does anti-racism mean to you? Okay. Super. Um, I, I believe anti-racism to me and anti-racist is is to me a verb. Um, I always de I describe myself, but I like to borrow from a friend, um, being a racist anti-racist. So for me as a white woman, um, and especially here in the United States, the way that our, the colonization of this country, <clears throat> um, I, I believe that I cannot help but have you know, growing up in and being bred in a racist society or what I would call white supremacist culture, <clears throat> that racism is not necessarily, you know, someone that I that I am or I'm bad, but it is in me. 
And so I call myself a racist anti-racist. So that means that it's, to me, it's a verb. Being an anti-racist is an action. It's not um, who I am. It's what I strive to be and how I act every day. And it's something I can't just do once. <laughs> I have to be doing it all the time. And you actually work as an anti-racist consultant uh, in, in the States and, and you're available, uh, you know, you, you have materials available to, to everyone online, don't you? Yes, I have materials online. Um, my background originally was as a therapist and social worker, but uh, I still do a variety of consulting, trainings, uh, super clinical supervisions and coaching, um, many trainings, but everything that I do at this point in my life is all anti-racist, anti-oppressive focused. And uh, Phineas, if I can get you to introduce yourself next and, and tell me about how you manage discomfort. Hi, Marcia. Hi. Um, I'm an architecture critic. I've, I've sort of run away from that though. And I now um, work at a charity called Open City, which you, you know, may know because of the Open House Festival, which is our biggest thing, but we also do an enormous amount of work with children in London, um, particularly focusing on communities who are underrepresented in architecture, but the wider built environment as well. Um, I mean, discomfort is, a, we're British, right? Like the British empire is extraordinarily complicit in all manner of uh, horrific things in the past. And I think to understand that history, has to come with a level of understanding, um, with a level of discomfort, right? It's pretty grim what Britain did in the past. I'm also a Christian and there's all, so many awful things that have happened in the name of Christianity. And these are kind of very uh, uncomfortable feelings to reckon with when you, you know, you don't want to sort of um, abandon your faith or uh, emigrate to another country, but you still want to find some way of navigating this complex and very difficult history that is wrapped up in race, that is wrapped up in gender, that is wrapped up in class and wealth and all of these things that affect us on a very personal level every day. So my approach to managing that level of discomfort is to lean into it, I guess, to sort of rather than running away and, and be like, oh, I don't want to talk about the British Empire. Actually, let's learn about it. Let's learn about um, as much as possible because we don't learn about it in schools. <laughs> Our parents might not have learned about it in schools either, so they, they, they can't always teach us. Um, because the more that we know, the more we understand about the context that um, has shaped us, the better we'll be able to see its flaws and the better we'll be able to act with whatever power we do have to dismantle the problems that we perceive um, in society. Thank you. Thanks for that, Finn. And, and Jim, Jim Rooney, if you could introduce yourself and, and tell me about your your journey with discomfort and, and sure. yeah, following up with that. Morning. Uh, I'm Jim. Uh, I work as an architect in London uh, for E2 Architecture. Uh, I grew up in, was born in France actually, and grew up in France until I was 18. Uh, started out in a uh, French school at the age of about four. Um, was um, picked on for being different at that time because I was the only English kid within a French environment. Uh, my parents realised how depressed I was at that age and moved me across the country to put me in a British school where I was then picked on for being different again because I was the only English kid that was had never grown up in England. Uh, so I've learned uh, through sort of that experience throughout my life, the sort of the, um, the plight of people who are different uh, and, and how that difficulty can manifest in your life. And so I've always been aware from my own experience going through school um, and recognizing how that sort of, how society and how even a school environment can sort of um, affirm and uh, sort of, uh, how, how, do you, how would you say, um, implements this sort of normality, which is all about um, picking on people who are not this sort of white, male, cisgendered, straight norm that we measure everything against. And so, you know, we're talking today about, um, you know, uh, sort of discomfort. Um, and one of my favorite speeches by Malcolm X is about uh, being proud of being maladjusted. And I think that speaks very well to this idea that, as you were just saying, to lean into it, to understand that we are all different and to understand what that difference can be and to be aware of it and to therefore, you know, confront yourself in those instances where you see someone being treated unfairly or differently um, and to say something and to do something about it. So, 
Thank you, thank you, Finn. Thank you, uh, Jim, for the, for those uh, insights. Uh, Robin, uh, listening to these two white British men over here um, uh, <laughs> talking about their, you know, their, their their ability to lean into that discomfort uh, in your anti-racism work, is, is that something that's usual to come across? Hmm. Um, no, and especially you know, as we think about. And, and as I say that, I want to be careful to say that, like, I'm not all there and all woke, um, you know, I, when I, so rather than pointing at the two of you, <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, I think sometimes I find the more educated, the more intellectual um, we are as white folks, that the more we don't, we are so disconnected from our bodies. And, and I think that, you know, white supremacy culture teaches us to value the intellect over the body and so I often find you know people raised and very you know male if you are raised as a male there's also this like value the intellect and don't and don't value the body um and so leaning in because it is so uncomfortable is not something that you know that is found often how did you come to be involved in anti-racist work <laughs> Um, so there is an, an, a group here called the People's Institute of Survival and Beyond, um, and they've been about around 30 years, started as a grassroots group, um, and they do trainings that they call um, Undoing Racism and Community Organizing. And so I attended one of those three-day trainings with a group of uh, directors. I was working at a nonprofit in New York City where we worked in schools and we had grants. And so we were a majority of white clinicians and trainers going into schools that were majority of black and brown children and families. Um, and finally, you know, through one of our uh, folks of color that were working for us, enough people were like, you know, you guys, <laughs> you need to look at what's happening in the way that you are operating. And so we all as a group, 11 of us attended this training and I I walked out of there um, and I always forget which pill they take on the matrix, but I took the pill that said, you're not waking up from this. And all of a sudden it was just like somebody took a snow globe and rocked my world. And I realized I've been seeing the world in like with blinders on. So that's kind of where my journey started. And how much um, uh, pushback do you <laughs> get? You know, even though people invite you to discuss this with them what is it like in reality when you do open that can of worms yeah um it can get really uncomfortable um i just spoke yesterday with another white colleague of mine who does similar work and we support each other and she got slammed by an organization and you know what often happens in these conversations and not, you know, with white folks, with folks of color, you know, because we all bought into this system. And so what happens is people get triggered. And I feel like when you're talking about shame or you're talking about discomfort, you get, you know, the typical, it's like fight, you know, flight <laughs> or it freeze. And so often you'll get the really direct and then people go quickly to their intellect and they want to challenge and they want to talk about the words. Uh, they want to attack and they just want to talk about how they're, they're the exception, their organization is the exception, and I don't see this. And, and then there's ways, instead of dealing with what's really coming up, it'll be my facilitation and how I wasn't nice to this other person and I made them uncommon. It just, it's like total kind of projection back onto me. Um, and people are often voluntold to come to some of these things when I work with organizations and there's so many levels. Um, and it can be really hard, you know, because I think for me, one of the key principles is like making sure that I am acting from humanity, like seeing the humanity in each other. And there are times when it's really, it can be really triggering for me. Um, I would say my defense mechanism when really put in that situation can be to attack. <laughs> and I have to, part of my work with kind of leaning in and sitting in the discomfort is to really be able to regulate my body 
and to remind myself that these are other human beings and you know sitting in front of me and the more I understand about how people react and how uncomfortable and painful it can be for some people to really be confronted with this um the more compassion I can have but I'm not going to lie and say that it's simple <laughs> or that I do it well all the time um but you know you're really dealing with people their their worlds are being shaken and um it's as if they have to hang on and they'll do anything they can to hang on to the truth that as they see it that makes them comfortable well we'll be talking about that uh, fallacy of truth of course, you are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from 66 Portland Place at uh, the HQ of uh, the Royal Institute of British Architects. I'm Marsha Ramrup, and we are basing all of our output on cultural intelligence. And this is a capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. It's the behavioral framework that allows us to consciously create procedures to mitigate the influence of hidden bias. And research has proved that in order to be successful at working with those who are different from us, we need four capabilities, CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy, and CQ action. Today, Reba Radio is focusing on CQ Drive, and that's the level of someone's interest, their persistence, their confidence to function with those who are different from them. And CQ Drive, intrinsic interest, extrinsic interest, and self-efficacy, the confidence piece are all the things that we're exploring. A full description of what I've just described there, uh, it was explored with Dr. David Livermore of the CQ Centre yesterday. And you can see and hear all of that full discussion on Reba's YouTube channel. It's subtitled there too. And can I just say too, because I know I'm, I'm actually drawing attention to this and maybe I shouldn't, but my girls have now made me hypersensitive to it. I used to have a full head of hair, really rich, really thick, but on that video, I didn't quite get the comb over right. Uh, I'm blaming it on the menopause. Uh, I, I think I should just get rid of all my hair and embrace the balding look that's evident on that video. Uh, so if you if you go to see the baldness and stay for the content, I'm a happy woman. Uh, I did panic a little yesterday, actually, because um, I, I'm, I stay with my mum when I'm in London. I, I live uh, up in Derby with my family and I saw in the bathroom that we had the same anti-wrinkle cream. Anyhow, talking of discomfort, uh, I'm speaking to Robin Schlenger, uh, uh, Jim Rooney and Phineas Harper about facing up to it. Um, and before, before the track, the very moving track uh, from Bob Marley there, um, we were, Robin was saying some really pertinent mm. things about, you know, leaning into that discomfort. You know, Jim, what, what did you think about what Robin was saying there? I, I think what was really interesting um, was when Robin was talking about the, the sort of the go-to response that she often gets when she's doing this work. And that that's definitely something that I can relate to and, and I, I always will come from my experience of this I, I my wife is black she's from a Caribbean background and my children have that dual heritage so there's that kind of impetus within me to kind of overcome these things but often when I'm confronted with my privilege and my, and, and my understanding of the world and the way that I've been brought up that that go-to response is often anger it's often just complete upset but it's an anger that really I direct at myself, but still comes out to other people around me, which is, which is the real tragic thing about it. Um, so I can definitely relate to, to that being the issue. And I, you know, the way that I approach it these days is just to, to implement a philosophy is just every day is a new day. We start from scratch and we try and make that day better than the one that came before. And that's, that's the only way that I can deal with the sort of the magnitude of, of this issue that is present in my, my being and my life. Um, so yeah, that's that's how how I take it. Finn, that the magnitude, the size of of the issue of, of of managing that discomfort. I mean, obviously, race is just just a part of it, but a really big part of it. And you 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 mentioned British history as well. I mean, what's your take on what what Jim and and Robin have been saying? Um, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because you're you're both right. Like people generally don't lean in. They generally run away. They they you see them do the weird things like hide what schools they went to on LinkedIn <laughs> because they went to quite a posh school and they, they don't want that, that to be sort of known. Um, we did some research at the Architecture Foundation a, a few years ago looking at the founders of the practices that had got into New Architects 3, which is this sort of very glamorous book about the best British architecture practices. And over half of them had been to private schools, these founders. 
Um, which is, you know, astonishing when you think that only 5% of um, British people go to, a, a, to go to private schools, that, you know, ar architecture, at least the successful practices that are coming forward are like extraordinarily unrepresentative of the British public at last. But you very rarely hear um, anyone from those backgrounds just like be upfront about it. You know, I went to private school, gave me some advantages. Here's how I've used those advantages to help others, or here's how I've used those advantages um, for good, which is very, it's kind of disappointing, right? Because, you know, if you think of Spider-Man, right, the, the, what, the, what the central message of the whole kind of Spider-Man series is with, with power comes responsibility. And I guess, ultimately, when you're talking about race or gender or um, wealth or any of this stuff, or, or like being British versus being from the global south or not being British, you're talking about power. And Spider-Man, the character, has extraordinary power and wrestles with that power to try and do good and do good in, in ways that um, help the people around him, that protect his loved ones from harm. He doesn't run away and hide in shame. Oh, I'm feeling so ashamed that I've been given this extraordinary power. He uses it and he uses it well and he's very upfront about it. You know, he dresses up and so on. Um, so it's a sort of slightly sort of silly metaphor, but I think we could all do with being a little bit more like Spider-Man, just being upfront about our power, acknowledging where it comes from, thinking about how we got it, how we got an unfair advantage because we went to a great school or, um, or whatever our advantage happens to be. And then using that power to affect positive change in the world. So I just, yeah, it's sad to hear that people are, are kind of um, running away um, I think there's, there's far more to gain from being upfront, explicit and um, proactive about how you use power than there is to gain from, from sort of avoiding it or, or not, not confronting it. That's amazing, isn't it, Robin, to hear? Um, I mean, I don't know whether you use the Spider-Man analogy, Robin, at all. <laughs> Uh, but you know that that sense of of are you able to get that message across when you're when you're doing your anti-racist work? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, and I'm just laughing when 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 you use the spider man because I have a mentor, Dr. Ken Hardy, who often says, you know, those with the most power and privilege have the most, and, I, and you you just worded it well, and I always forget how it goes. So I'm like, oh, it was Spider Man, <laughs> not Dr. Ken Hardy, or that's where he got it from. Um, yeah, and I, you know, and I want to apologize as I, I just thought back when I it both said like it was like very surprising to see, see two men. Um, and I have to take that back because I'm going to get hell for that. You know, in the community that that I am in, um, where where um, there are many men doing this work. Um, but again, I'm in a bubble. I often think about the community. I'm first of all living in New York City. Um, and I've created, I've created, I've built a network of folks um, over the several years um, because this needs to happen in community. And in that community, there are many um, male identified folks. So I want to just kind of, you know, take that back because it might not be common, but it is, you know, I, I know many men that are doing this work. <laughs> And certainly, you know, as, you, as you're doing that work, um, what sort of actions are you suggesting people take to try to manage that discomfort, to, to lean into it, to, to recognise the defensiveness as it happens? I think, um, well, I mean, just to, to name, of course, I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, certainly would not be here doing this work if it was not for the many shoulders, you know, that I stand on. And many of those are, are folks of colour. And I do, I co-facilitate um, a training called Shame Resilience and Transformation Skills for White People with Dr. Alana Tappan. And Dr. Tappan is, uh, she was born and, in Jamaica and she now lives in Canada. And so this was her brainchild. Um, and and this, is, this could be a whole nother radio show, but you know, she started talking about what she sees in white folks and that she really sees shame um, as this huge barrier for white folks that when once we're feeling shame, it's almost like the lizard brain gets activated, right? And then we can't, if we can't work through that and trans, you know, and transform it, then we are not gonna be able to show up. We're not gonna be able to show up for racial justice. We're not gonna be able to show up to do the work that we say we want to do. So. What we do, one of the many things that we that you know we do in the workshop is to really, 
you know, we used a lot of Resma Menekin's work and like just thinking about how you have to, it's our nervous systems that are so like my brain might know that if I talk about race or I have a conversation about race, um, I'm going to be uncomfortable. You know, my, but my brain knows it's discomfort, but my body might sense it as like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like my body thinks that it is, it, it can be that uncomfortable that the automatic nervous system just takes over. So we really work with folks to kind of um, validate, to name, you know, name all the things that are coming up. We talk about the ugly thoughts and the biases and the things that we've said to people and the microaggressions. Um, and we sit with it and we use empathy towards ourselves. But Alana and I call it accountable empathy. It's not like, oh, it's okay, I'm gonna let it go. It doesn't mean I'm not accountable for my actions and I'm not accountable to do better. And we really try to work with folks to be able to regulate their nervous systems. And, and we talk a lot about co-regulation, you know, that that's part of, again, white supremacy culture really kind of stands up individual, you know, and in order, we look at anti-racism, this is a collective, we're a collective humanity. So empathy um, and self-regulation and learning how to sit through the discomfort is really a lot of the work that we do so that we can transform the, the guilt and a lot of that stuff that, um, you know, that comes up for us and use it, you know, and be able to use it. Finn, how do you feel about um, describing our system in which we live, if you like, as, as being white supremacist or, you know, that white supremacy? How, how does that make you feel? Um, I mean, that's very, yeah. I don't, I don't, I guess I don't feel anything. Like it, it feels very accurate. Um, I think that's a kind of accurate description of uh, certainly British history. Well, over the last few hundred years, let's say. Um, and that history is very much still with us. So I, yeah, I, I, I try to just take that as a sort of scientific observable fact. And then the question is, okay, well, what do you do about that? Rather than getting bogged down in, in, in like, oh, how does that make me feel I, I i do sort of feel like um the media is very bad at this the media the media goes rather than in my experience people understand this stuff better than the media does and the media i know you worked at the bbc so i'm sorry about this but it's i okay. do feel that <laughs> sometimes uh, the media gets very anxious about these terms like white supremacy or or, or, or privilege or, or whatever it is uh, and turns it into a bigger debate than it really ought to be it ought to just be a kind of fairly straightforward acknowledgement of, of of like fairly recent history um but the media gets it wrong and so often you know a working class black or brown teenager in north kensington has far more in common with a working class white retired person in in stockport for example but that's not how the media would have us believe it the, the media sort of likes to pretend that everyone in the South is a kind of quinoa guzzling posho metropolitan elite and everyone in the North is the child of a minor or something. Um, and of course, this is kind of utter nonsense um, and it, it drives us apart. So instead of seeing opportunities to build solidarity, to build coalitions, to actually kind of take down some of these 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 white supremacist structures we end up retreating into these um these bubbles or, or, or these kind of tribes that are uh, told we're told we live in by our kind of biased media and so i guess i'm really interested in seeing how we how we can um yet yeah, lean in sure but also like build those coalitions that will actually affect change and i was very persuaded by the writer emma dabiri in um uh, she wrote what white people can, can do, do next, next. Mm. which is an, an extraordinary book um sort of isn't quite what it sounds like it's going to be um but there's this amazing chapter in it um about the the alliance between the black panthers and the, the young patriots in the states and and you know we should be careful about confusing the uk and the us they're very very different mm. contexts but her point is that um the young patriots who are a kind of white group and black panthers who are clearly black um, build a coalition and uh, it's not based on shame it's based on mutual respect because they understand that they have more to gain by working together than they do by working apart and in the end the the, the patriots stop using the confederate flag um, out of respect for the panthers uh, they haven't been you know 
shamed on social media into stopping using it. Mm. But they, they, they proactively make that choice because they have come to understand that the Panthers struggle and uh, they recognize that there, there's far more for them as, as, as working class people to gain by working together than um, they could if they were sort of working against each other or seeing each other's struggles as in competition. It's not a zero sum game. Um, and so I think this, this term white supremacy is a, is, is a good one. Um, but hopefully the, the challenge is how do we all get together and tackle that supremacy rather than um, seeing it as, as something that, um, you know, that we, can, that we have to compete to fight against. We're speaking to Phineas Harper, Robin Schlenger and Jim Rooney. Hey guys, Hamza Sheikh here. I'm really looking forward to sharing my Reba Radio Hour with you guys, where I'm going to take you through a bit of a personal journey, share some of the songs I've selected, and boy are they varied. I've got Pakistani Western fusion music, I've got UK jazz rap, and there's even some classical Japanese music in there. Yeah, you're definitely not going to want to miss this. A super wide variety and a bit of an adventure. So make sure you tune in today at 5 p.m. Right now, we're speaking about discomfort, defensiveness and being resilient to white shame with Robin Schlenger, uh, Jim Rooney and Phineas Harper. Um, some really, really interesting points made by Robin and Finn before Doja Cat about white supremacy. I mean, what were your thoughts listening to that, Jim? Yeah, I mean, I think um, picking up on what Robin was talking about and the sort of the paralysis that kind of happens when uh, you confront your own privileges. Um, you know, I think I think that the point is, is that we're talking about discomfort and discomfort can can be paralyzing. Right. Um, and so you have to be able to get to a point with it where it's still functional. You can still function within the, the discomfort, which is difficult. It's really difficult to do. And yeah you know this is i think the, the the larger problem the wider problem with society and when we talk about white supremacy it's that that triggering kind of phrase for a lot of people and they do just completely go into this state of paralysis and they don't know how to react and so they close down shut down and walk away from the conversation and so what's really interesting i think about a lot of the work that open city are doing and various other organizations and, and when you're talking about the media getting it wrong they do because that you know when we talk about white supremacy you have to define it in terms of power control and money and right this, these are the people that have the power the money and the control and they are intent on keeping that power that money and that control and so they use the mechanisms that they have to control the narrative and so you have to usurp that system and the way that you do that, which comes back to, to what Phineas and, and his organization are doing and many others, is that you start at the bottom. You start at the sort of granular grassroots level and you go out into the community and you deal with it on, a, on an individual basis. You just change one person's mind at a time. And that's the, the, the work that I do in my local community that I, f I find so rewarding. And, and you start with yourself, you start with your family, you start with your friends, you know, who, whoever it is that you interact with. And if you can just make a change, one change, every day then you're winning you know we're winning do you recognize how unusual you are or certainly from many other people's perspective as a white man to have that point of view i, I do um but that doesn't sort of make me rest on my laurels in any kind of way um you know it's that and that's not the, the reason why i do this it's not to kind of just you know, make myself feel good about the fact that I'm different in that respect. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, yeah, of course, I recognise that, that that I have an unusual take on this, I guess. And, and, and Finn, from your point of view, you know, in architecture, in architecture, do you feel that, you know, that there is um, an, an ex acceptance of this idea that white supremacy is something that you know is it a phrase we can use in in the sector um well it certainly feels like it's growing in in, in maybe in my generation i don't know but um uh maybe i'm lucky to be in a bubble of of, of colleagues and volunteers who who are all working towards the mission around making the city more equitable and so um, it's something that we talk about quite a lot at um, Open City, but you know, ha have been talking about at the Architecture Foundation and other places for a while. Um, but I, I think Jim's sort of spot on there that, like, in a way, it doesn't matter how kind of woke you are deep down, uh, how how much you see the system, or how comfortable you are using these terms. It's about what you do, 
right? And um, to, to, to pick another uh, superhero, <laughs> Batman would say, it's not who I am underneath, but it's what I do that defines me. Yeah. And I think that's a very powerful thought that, you know, like we can talk about this stuff and um, f finding a way to kind of navigate shame or to, to, to be comfortable using terms that might be triggering for others is, is all very good. Um, but the next step has to be, okay, having had those conversations, what do we then use our power that we've realized we have to do to affect change? How do we use that to build some, some, some coalitions, to set up a new program that might support people in a different way, to moderate the way that we are as individuals, either on stage or in a community? How do we go out and like, meet people where they are? What, what changes do we make having kind of realized how biased and how unfair and how complicated um, the world that we we live in is. Yeah, really, really good point. And, and to reference Emma Dabiri again, she talks about coalition over allyship as well. Um, uh, Robin, um, I, I don't know if you can speak to this, um, but sometimes racialized individuals can feel uncomfortable when we see white people's discomfort talking about race or being confronted with racism i remember discussing on a podcast how we can we we as, as people of color needed to get comfortable with that discomfort and, and lead into that ourselves do you have any particular tips a, a, around that is it the same kind of process that mm -hmm. you would suggest that for, for white people it's interesting um no i and i think it's different um and it is really hard to speak for folks of color. I can only speak from what I've been told and, you know, experiences that have been shared with me. Um, that would be a tough one for me as a white person to say, like, y'all need to lean into the discomfort of watching white people learn. Um, I mean, I think there's this really piece of, like, I don't remember where I read it, but someone kind of described, like, you know, for white folks, we're kind of still, like, in preschool when it comes to talking about race, you know, when folks of color have a PhD because they have, they've always, you know, seen themselves as racialized, you know, and like, I have a race, I have a race, you know, we always other, we talk about race, it's everybody but white people. So I do believe, you know, and a lot of, a lot of this came up with the work that I was doing with Alana that she wanted to do a workshop, you know, with shame resilience for folks of color and realizing that like, there is a shame, but it shows up very differently. Um, and I, and I think that in order to, you know, if we're talking about liberation for all of us, you know, um, that we all have, have work to do, but I think that folks of color and white folks have different work to do. Um, I think we need to do some work on our own. And then I also very much believe that we need to, we can, we can work together. Um, but there's so many different things that can show up, um. So I don't, I don't know if I'd say lean into the discomfort. I, I have to say that like, I don't expect, or, you know, when I'm, when I'm in relationship with folks of color or having conversations or doing trainings, I don't expect anything. I don't expect lenience. I don't expect to be given um, grace. Um, and it's not about, I'm not sitting there saying like, I'm a horrible human being because I'm white and I don't deserve it. It's just that, I understand to, to the best level that I can, you know, that it's two different experiences. And I've just seen so many folks of color injured um, and re-traumatized by having to sit in some conversations, you know, even with us white folks who are talking about this and, and have an understanding, we still, you know, we're still going to be white people. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a long answer to a question I think is is tough for me to answer, but that's the best way that I can. Now I appreciate that for trying, Robin, because I, yeah, I did put <laughs> you in a bit of a difficult position there. I mean, Jim, I saw you nodding your head away there. You know, what was it that particularly struck you about what Robin? Well, I was mean, saying? you know, I, I'm in a relationship with a black woman, and fundamentally, I, I totally uh, I get it. You know, it's like, and and it's it, there's so so much of our relationship comes down to this barrier that is my whiteness. Um, and you, you, you can just feel, I can feel the frustration from her side where she's just like, really this again, you know, am I really going to have to sit through this again whilst you get to the point where you know, you need to get to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that, and that's really difficult. You know, I, 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 likewise, I can't really speak to how that must feel or, 
or, or, or advise, you know, how to deal with that. Uh, I just know that it's a work in progress in, in my relationship with my wife. Mm. Finn, you know, when you reflect on, on, on that sense of, you know, people of colour watching you go through mistakes, watching you learn and, and, and go through, do, what, what do you think you, you can do differently maybe to, to help them with that situation? That's a tough one, I know. Yeah, like I, I yeah, I, I also couldn't really, um, wouldn't want to try and answer like what it's like for other people to see. I, I think it's, I mean, this is a part of the problem with this whole conversation is it, it tries to make an enormously complex situation quite simple. And of course, there's there's no such thing as 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 folks of color. There's many many different types of people from different places with different backgrounds. Um, the British Empire alone has, you know, enormous number of like different complex atrocities to answer for um, in different parts of the world. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really resistant to making kind of broad brush generalizations about what different people experience in different situations. I do think, though, that um, we can all we can all do more and we should all be trying to do more. Um, white people, bosh people, male people, I should say, actually, I, I'm, I'm non-binary. So um, that's a, a kind of new identity that I'm grappling with re more recently, but maybe I'm less able to speak from the perspective of a man than I used to be. Um, but whatever kind of background we come from, um, we have to acknowledge that the world is not not very fair at all. And so just some of the stats that we've, we've talked through today and, and uh, that will be thrown around in, in this radio show over the next few days, really reveal the extent to which we don't live in a meritocracy, that the game is rigged and um, we have to find ways, whether we, we are the beneficiary of that rigging or, or the, the victim of that rigging, we have to find ways to call it out and to, to dismantle it. And I, I'm, I think we can do it. I think enormous strides are being made, um, but there's an enormous, enormously long way to go still. Um, and so uh, I'm always looking for... for, for ways to use my power such as it is and i would encourage any everybody listening to this to, to to critically reflect on what what leg ups you've got in your your life they could be small things they could be huge things um and how will you use that little bit of extra power that you've you've been gifted to do something um to dismantle this white supremacist superstructure that we all live in many thanks to phineas harper jim rooney and robin schlenger for talking about discomfort talking about uh, that shame piece and really being open about their own experiences. Reba Radio with Marsha Rebu. You are listening to Reba Radio. I am Marsha Ramroop, the Director of Inclusion at the Royal Institute of British Architects, bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. It's all rooted in CQ, cultural intelligence. And yesterday, we heard from Dr. David Livermore about cultural intelligence. Uh, we heard from Dr. Pragya Agarwal about unconscious bias. We heard about the Inclusion Charter. We heard about the context of inclusion in architecture up till now if you've missed it you've not missed it it's all going to be replayed over this weekend uh, you can see the subtitle videos on reba's youtube channel and we'll be making content into podcasts too uh, earlier today we heard about getting it wrong and dealing with fear and we've just had the most brilliant conversation um, I think anyway, <laughs> about white shame and resilience to it. So it's it's been really, really great to be able to, to bring all of that to you. Um, and coming up, we have invited seven special guests from the worlds of architecture, design, arts and culture to present a pre-recorded music hour each day. And our guest presenters sharing personal stories, unique insights reflected by their choice of top tunes coming across from you know all areas of the musical spectrum. Earlier, we had on uh, talking about fear and getting it wrong uh, was Hamza Sheikh, uh, the architectural design and podcast producer. And in 2014, Hamza nearly failed his first year in architectural school, but then his illustrations began getting a lot of attention on Instagram and Hamza began to fall in love with architecture and he has decided to do one of our music hours for us. His music soundtrack takes us from Motown to Japan to Pakistan, so it'll be a fantastic mix. 
You're listening to Reba Radio, real inclusive, real action with Marshall Lamb. And when we think about CQ Drive, one of the key components is extrinsic interest. It can be a desire to uh, change the outcomes uh, around data analysis, around EDI. And I mentioned earlier the statistic of Asian students dropping off education. And we heard about women. Uh, we, we know about women that a lot start architecture education, and that's proportional to the population. So you get about 50% of women starting architecture education, but they leave at every stage but what data should we collect is it even worth it uh, when we see the problem and we hear anecdotally there's a problem so why do we need data and what stories can we tell about that and what's the purpose and what's the power of those stories well to chat through this with me is Mac Mac along of the equal group and wallpaper journalist Ellie Stathaki uh, Mac if I can start with you by asking what does the equal group do Thank you. Uh, thank you firstly for inviting me onto the show. Um, essentially, the Equal Group is a diversity and inclusion consultancy. We specialise in data, um, typically helping organisations to obtain as much um, quantitative and qualitative data around equality, diversity and inclusion as possibly possible. Typically, that starts with an audit. So we help companies to really improve their um, response rates in terms of staff engagement surveys. Um, but again, asking both qualitative and quantitative questions to understand who's in the organization, demographic makeup, you know, position, tenure, um, but also matching that with how they feel because it's um, pointless having kind of great amounts of diversity if the experience isn't universally positive. Exactly. I, I always speak to that. And, and Mac, I mean, you know, my, my journey through uh, believing that data is important has been quite a significant one mm. because I've always really like, look around you. You can see what the problem is here. You know, why do you need the data? So why do you need the data? Again, it is really just giving context, you know, the presence and or absence of individuals isn't the, the be all and end all. It's really about how those people feel, how, how you interact with them. Um, but the data can tell you so much around where you need to, to spend your time and attention. You know, one of the things that we often see with equality, diversity, and inclusion generally is a lack of progress. Um, and one of the things that we accredit that to is a lack of data. You know, how do you know what issues you're trying to fix? How do you know when you've started to make progress? How do you know when your initiatives are failing? Typically, there's been a lack of data collection, a lack of data anal analysis that allows you to give that depth of, of um, credibility to the work that you're doing. You know, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't look at finances and discard the data and pretend that you're, or assume that you're doing good without the data to back up how good you're doing, where you're doing well, where you're not doing well, and where you can make improvements. Um, we typically compare kind of equality, diversity, and inclusion to a weight loss journey. You know, if you're on a weight loss journey, it would be redundant not to measure your progress. It would be redundant not to weigh yourself or to, to measure yourself. Um, so you can really be specific about the diet that you um, then take up, the, the types of exercise that you do. It all depends on what the data tells you about where your significant problems are, um, but then also where your ambitions are as well. So unless you have targets, unless you have a clear vision in mind of where, where it is you want to go, um, it becomes problematic or impossible for you to really target your in initiatives in the right way. That's exactly how I feel about targets. You've got to know where you are so you can know where you need to go. Exactly. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, analogy, the weight loss an analogy. I, I talk about in becoming inclusion fit, the same as getting inclusion fit. You need to be motivated to get off the couch, etc. Yeah. So, um, and, and also that piece about the, the, the checking yourself and the scales, it actually can be a motivator mm -hmm. as well to say, well, yeah, I need to, I need to do better. Now, did you... Is, how did you come into this work? Yeah. Because did you set out to become a DNI data expert? Not in my wildest dreams. Um, it's it's uh, a, an interest, or well, I think it's an interesting story. Um, essentially, my background. I do too, which is why I invited <laughs> you to answer it. It's always a, a risky position to take to say that something's interesting because everyone might think the opposite. Um, but my background is in the energy sector, so I spent ten years as a regulatory consultant. Um, and within that role, you know, a lot of my um, position was focused on helping executive teams understand the regulatory environment. Um, the energy industry has a plethora of data, you know, data about um, pipe sizes, how long pipes have been in place, wires, the length of wires, line loss factors, just really technical, super geeky things about, you know, 
the the length of meters and the capacities and um, efficiency ratios and all of these really really um, technical calculations um, but it allows them it allows us as an industry to really focus our time and attention in the right direction um, it also allows us to understand where the need is for intervention um, but during my journey in the the energy sector I'm not sure how much you know about the sector but it's not great for diversity um, but I've, as I moved up the, the industry I started getting a little bit more frustrated at being kind of the only person of colour in the room, the only person that didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge or private school um, and started having more conversations with leaders just to understand whether I was being overly sensitive or whether it was an issue that was, was widely um, seen and acknowledged. Um, and what those conversations led to is that um, leaders did acknowledge the issue, they, they understood that it was, there was an issue, they didn't necessarily know what they could do to change things um, and that was also um, it also went hand in hand with a, a little bit of a political fear. So people didn't necessarily want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, um, which led to a kind of a, you know, a wait and see approach. As I looked more around at the, the diversity and inclusion space, I found that nobody was really measuring data. We were kind of moving into this area of just doing quite arbitrary things for, for kind of for the sake of it. So doing annual unconscious bias training with no expectation of, of where that training would take you, no expectation of, you know, what the end result is uh, in terms of what you're trying to see across your organization. Um, so essentially off the back of those conversations, just started really looking at what data do we need? What data um, is available? We found that there, there wasn't much available. So we essentially set out to help companies get that data uh, and bring it to life a little bit more. Now, Ellie, um, just listening to Mac there, it's clear that the telling of the story around what that data says is really important. So tell me about some of the storytelling that goes along with that, because dry data, I mean, you know, you get you, you appear to get quite excited about technical things there, Mac, but uh, not everyone does. <laughs> A hundred percent. And um, I, firstly, just to say thank you so much. It's such an honor to be part of this um, program. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm going to be open. I'd say like when you told me, oh, Ellie, come and talk to us about data and statistics. I was like, what? Really? <laughs> because, I mean, you know, uh, we don't, I suppose it's not like numbers is not the first line of reporting that we do um, a wallpaper. You know, we might include the statistics here and there, but it's not really, we're not driven by that in a sense uh, that we don't kind of report that. But as you say, um, numbers can be fascinating and um, they uh, help draw attention to things. They make you sit up and kind of take notice, um, which um, helps me, I guess, pick up a story to start with, um, and then um, it helps you map out a landscape. However, as you rightly said, uh, I, I feel people are generally more kind of compelled by stories than by numbers, or rather the numbers make you pay attention at first, but then what keeps that attention and what, what is it that makes you like motivate you to do something further. And I think that is inspirational people, inspirational buildings, inspirational stories, well, buildings in our case. Um, so it, it is the kind of essentially, I suppose, case studies or, um, you know, stories that come out of these numbers that help um, maintain people's attention and stay with you. And um, in a way, it's this inspirational stories that we like to report in a wallpaper that will say, oh, I, I remember this, I read this a wallpaper, or I remember, you know, that story was about this person who did this thing rather than, you know, the specific number that was behind it. And certainly that's that's the case, isn't it? That it's the, the storytelling around the data that uh, perhaps is the the, the bigger driver rather than necessarily the numbers itself. Would you agree with that, Matt? Yeah, definitely. I think context is everything. And, and this is one of the reasons why we do a lot of cross-sector work because um, we can't get into the, the fall into the trap, sorry, of assuming that some issues are just with an organization. Sometimes they're sector-wide, sometimes they're, they're geographical when we're looking at kind of gaps in data and also interventions that need to be made. You know, there's no point one company in a sector doing well and everybody else failing. You know, some of the, the challenges need to be tackled at a sectoral level, but the context that data gives us and, you know, for, for a kind of insight, when we talk about data, we're not just talking about the numbers, we're also talking about the, the qualitative. Um, and that's really about, you know, the, 
the messaging, the story, the framing that comes along with it. I think one of the things that we found is that even when people do have data, they're not leveraging it in the right way. So it is about how do you tell a story that compels people to act, you know, numbers in and of themselves aren't necessarily going to tell you what you need to know. Yes, and uh, I can't remember. There was one um, economist, I think, whose who's quote is, there's lies, damned lies and statistics, yeah. which you may well be uh, aware of that particular quote, um, Mac. And, and isn't there a danger? We can spin our numbers any way we want. The, you know, I, I guess as an economist, yes, there, there is that danger. You can put all kinds of, of theory behind numbers and um, speculate as to, you know, why why certain numbers are, are the way they are and i think we've seen a lot of that in this space you know when we're talking about diversity and inclusion you know one of the things that we found with regards to recruitment is a lot of people hiding behind the um you know quote unquote talent pipeline or the lack of talent in in certain communities um whereas when you look a little bit deeper the talent is there it's just that you're looking at it through a very narrow frame which doesn't allow you to see the potential talent or the talent that actually exists uh, we will continue with Mac along of the Equal Group, uh, wallpaper journalist Ellie Stathaki, talking about data as a driver for EDI change. Coming up in an hour, you will not want to miss Majid Majid is the Somali British activist and politician who served as Lord Mayor of Sheffield a couple of years ago. Tom Young, he won the gold medal in the men's 100 metres T38 race at the Tokyo Paralympics. And Sammy Kinghorn, the multi gold medal winning wheelchair athlete all talking about motivation that would be pretty something wouldn't it earlier we were talking about robin schlenk we were talking with robin schlenger jim rooney and phineas harper about white shame resilience and discomfort if you missed it like i say don't worry you haven't actually missed it um you just missed the live version and we're repeating all content broadcast between nine and one on this link so stay tuned to hear it again videos also being subtitled they're being put up on the reba youtube channel right now we're talking to matt alonge apologies for the mispronunciation of your surname earlier uh and wallpaper journalist ellie stathaki now i'm sure going to get it wrong because i've called it out uh talking about data as as a driver for EDI change and Mac uh, just a reminder EDI being equity diversity and inclusion yep. um, Mac um, what kind of data can you reasonably ask for this is an interesting that you phrased the question in that way um, re reasonable is kind of all relative right um, and again it talks to the reasoning for wanting the data I think a lot of companies fall in the trap of just wanting data for data's sake rather than wanting data to make a change. Um, and similarly to what we were talking about earlier, if you want to make a change in a certain area, you'll need data in that certain area. So if you want to change your recruitment statistics, it's vitally important to get your recruitment statistics. If you want to change employee experience, it's ex employee experience data that you need. Um, so I've, I've not really answered your question at all, <laughs> but um, what we advocate for companies is to get as much data as possible. However, I'll caveat that by saying that there has to be a change that comes as a result of, of getting that data. A lot of employees will resist being asked for data initially until they see that the data is being used in a meaningful and purposeful way. Mm. Um, a lot of a lot of companies have issues with trust. So, so how do they assure their employees that they they can be trusted with that data? One of the things that we always say is that trust is built up over time. You know, when you see positive changes, when you see that that data is being used in a meaningful and positive way, you're more likely to trust your organization with your data because you know that actually you believe in the vision Vision and, and talking to, to Ellie's point before, you, you believe in the narrative that is forming around that data. So identifying gaps and then working towards narrowing those gaps is part of that journey as to demonstrating that you can be trusted with that data. How okay or not is it for an organization to guess at people's characteristics it's definitely not okay it's, it's um yeah virgin on the immoral um and we, we have had a couple of horror stories especially in relation to kind of gender pay gap where you know companies found themselves in a position that they weren't collecting the data had no means of tracking it in a meaningful way um and then resorted to to guessing in some cases um based on people's names which 
unless wow yeah it's, it's just just a minefield of, of issues that that creates yeah i i think you know if you can see someone's um you know you're also guessing at gender as well mm -hmm. uh in some cases because not everyone identifies in a, a binary way even if exactly. they might f have a name that's traditionally one way or another mm -hmm. um ellie uh, you know spin <laughs> I'm not going to make you stand and, and, and speak on behalf of all of the media, um, but certainly, you know, how, how often do you see um, sort of statistics propping up a story or just trying to, uh, you know, create a particular narrative which may or may not be true? I mean, yeah, there's there's definitely danger um, in that, which is why it is important to kind of, I guess, look at the context where the number comes from, you know, and I... I I am always trying to be kind of super cautious of this myself um, because also media is a very kind of fast um, moving environment. So you often need to respond to things quite quickly. Um, so you have to make sure that where you kind of get your numbers from is a you know reasonably reliable source, uh, you know, samples um, that are correct. And it's often not about the numbers themselves, but also how they are represented and how, what, how they are interpreted, I guess which um yeah kind of has various layers of you know people's intentions and also like unconscious bias various things that come into um kind of reading things but yes i, I i'd say it's definitely something we have to look out for and are responsible for as media yeah i think it's it's, it's not just about the the numbers i think when you were talking about kind of the quant qualitative context um you know one of the things that we spent a lot of time looking at originally was kind of definitions because when we look at definitions of, of racism for example um coming from the the oxford english dictionary typically written by white middle-aged middle-class men um and you find that the definitions included in those those formal contexts are somewhat lacking um so we really need to scrutinize everything that goes alongside the data you know it's not just about the the kind of the numbers but also the qualitative context uh, thank you for, for actually mentioning that because uh, Dr. Pragya Agrawal, who was on yesterday talking about unconscious bias and myself are, are planning on, on trying to address that issue of the way that dictionaries define race and racism. So watch that space. I don't know what, what's going to be involved in that, but we're certainly talking about it. Um, what, what is actually involved, though, in an EDI audit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I think... I can't speak for all service providers that, that provide the EDI audits. Um, typically, we start with the, the context. So it's about what do you as an organization want to achieve? And really, that's tying equality, diversity and inclusion more um, holistically to your mission as an organization. Um, what's the direction of travel that you're going in? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and how do we make that relevant for all people? We then go into to organizations to work on comms. So, you know, what Ellie was talking about there in terms of making it interesting for people, you know, the, the narrative that goes alongside that. What is that for your organization? How do we align that to your tone of voice? You know, what what are the typical comms platforms or infrastructure that you use to communicate so that this message of, of EDI coming out isn't alien, isn't seen as separate, isn't seen as kind of something that is totally detached from the organization or what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we then provide a uh, kind of independent platform for organizations to do the survey on. Um, essentially, it's a survey that looks at both the qualitative and quantitative, so um, all protected characteristics, as well as some inclusion questions. And we work with organizations to define which questions they want included in that. So it's completely bespoke to the organization, um, completely centered around what they feel that their primary issues are or what their primary concerns are. Um, as a means to shedding light on the, you know, the significance of those issues um, from a quant quantitative perspective. Um, then we analyze that data and, and anonymize it. So making sure that individual respondents can't be identified because that's one of the things that breaks down trust. You know, if you perceive the fact that your manager is going to know that you don't actually enjoy your work or you, you have problems with kind of um, with that person, it may be, um, you know, it may be challenging in terms of how open and honest you are. So we, we provide anonymity as standard um, and make sure that that continues to be the case when we come to reporting. Um, we produce a, an online platform that allows individuals, so everybody within the organization that has been part of that audit, 
has access to the information that's been collected about them and their colleagues so that they can see what's going on in the organization in their department at their level in the organization but we also accompany that with a written report a written narrative around what, where we feel the priorities are for you as an organization um, what interventions you should be seeking to make in order to um, really align where you are as an organization with where you want to be but in something like architecture, and I'm sure Ali will have a point, it's, it's not particularly diverse. <laughs> There's a reason for my job, the reason for this oh, radio yes. station. Um, so, I mean, what it, it, we need data on everything, don't we? It, I mean, yes, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are working on it, hopefully, as we speak, <laughs> to amend that. Um, but yes, and, and as you say, like data, very important, but, and, and it is only the first step, right? Because they are the thing that will spring broad kind of other things and help you kind of come into action, right? Well, that's that's the plan. But, you know, it not being uh, like you spoke about the energy sector, not being, uh, you know, very mixed in, uh, environment. Um, there, there are many in architecture who who do work in, in mixed environments. And, and, and but, the, the, you know, pipeline um, is, is, is an issue. Um, the uh, way that people have progressed is an issue. Uh, the way that the products and services of architecture is created is problematic and then uh, you know how people engage with clients and uh, procurement other stakeholders and so what you know you say what you say you, you tailor it but then what data that should there is there a basic standard of what people should be collecting unfortunately i think it'd be a lot easier if there was um some of the work that we're doing across the, the energy sector and also starting to do more work on, in the construction sector is about creating that baseline and creating that minimum standard, if you like, of data that needs to be collected. Um, so we've recently won an award for our work across the energy sector. So working with 50 organizations on comparing and contrasting quality, diversity, inclusion data. Um, we're in our second year of collecting and um, visualizing that data the first year found that there was a distinct gap in terms of the recruitment of black asian minority ethnic candidates into the sector um, so at application stage they were represented at the 21 percent level um, and looking at the number of people that were given jobs um, following that application process that then um, reduced to 10 percent so we found that there's quite a clear drop off of, of black asian minority ethnic candidates that wasn't wasn't reflective of kind of the the overall um, journey across the sector so that's something over the last year we've been working with the sector to try to resolve um, and then this year by by the end of this year we should know more about kind of what how that gap has has closed if it has or, or what further work needs to be done um, but in answer to, to your question there is no set standard but i think it's something that there is room for um, that conversation across a, a sector to understand what is it that we want to to achieve um, and how do we go about ensuring that all organizations can contribute meaningfully to that there is a real clamor at the moment for meaningful data i mean i'm being pushed all the time from all sorts of people not only internally whether it be it's you know the competitions team or or the or the panels for awards or um uh, the um members asking you know we want to collect data what should we collect i mean uh, how important do you think it is um ellie to to make sure we we get this right in in the sector I, th I think it's very important. Um, I mean, as I said, the numbers are the starting point for kind of everything. It help, they help you, um, they motivate you to do something and they help you understand what the situation is now and where you're trying to go, as you said earlier. Um, it's also, I think, quite important to remember that it, sadly, it can be quite a slow game. So you need time to collect the data for things to progress. Um, I mean, I understand obviously that there's a very urgent need for like things to change, but at the same time, I think it's quite important to make sure that enough time is spent to do things properly almost. And how do we build that trust, do you think? Is there something about the storytelling in order that we can ensure that, that the people whose data we're collecting, which is which will be everyone, feels like? you know, it, it, it'll be used well rather than this spin or, or some kind of, uh, 
you know, uh, sensationalist way of it being presented? I mean, yes, again, I mean, I think that's <laughs> that's a tricky balance. And, and hopefully, I mean, I, I'm speaking for ourselves, uh, you know, as a magazine, where hopefully you have kind of built a certain trust with your audience and they come to you for a certain reason and they know what you're going to read in, in your magazine is, you know, kind of... Um, accurate and represents, you know, kind of in good faith and good, you know, kind of good research stuff that um, I guess helps them understand the, you know, what what is happening and helps inspire them. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's. Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to add to that. I think the the tendency for people to to think about it as spin or to, to not trust it is probably linked to how it's framed. Because I think a lot of the time, equity, diversity and inclusion is framed around a specific characteristic. So when we go into organisations and we ask them, you know, what do they understand diversity and inclusion to be? They typically say, you know, it's, it's about gender or it's about ethnicity, or it's about disability. And really it's about all of us, you know, all of us to some extent have some elements of, of difference all of us come from diverse experiences diverse um, walks of life um, and it's really about widening that frame of reference to ensure that everybody feels represented in the work that goes on this is why we frame it in terms of a universally positive experience so as organizations we should want all of our staff to have a universally positive experience and not feel that their experiences are limited based on their protected characteristic Similarly, when we're talking about the end user and the consumer or the, the service user, we need to be framing it around everybody having a universally positive experience, regardless of what their background is, regardless of what their protected characteristics are. And I'll make that parallel in terms of where we are in the energy sector. Everybody consumes energy. So it feels, um, it feels really quite weird. To, to you know, I was trying to to think of the the terminology, but it's really quite weird that the 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 leadership in the the energy sector doesn't represent the whole the whole um, population because the whole population routinely uses energy every day, whether they want to or not. Mm. And similarly, uh, we all live around buildings. Yes, and just to add just a little bit to, I I, I guess it also kind of goes back to. Um, sort of that balance you want to get as a publication of reaching the audience and getting people interested and engaged, but not being sensationalist, as you say. So it is about how you treat them and telling real stories and stories with like human interest. But I think, you know, up to a point, people can tell if you're using the facts in a kind of, um, you know, sensationalist way. Thanks so much to Maka Longay of the Equal Group and wallpaper journalist Ellie Stathaki talking about data as a driver for EDI change. Shortly, we'll be hearing from Emma Weber, CEO of Lever Learning, who uses data and measurement to move people forward with their learning. <laughs> Take a chance. Enter the Reba Radio Lucky Prize draw. Oh yes, oh yes, this is the moment you've been waiting for. More details about the Reba Radio Lucky Prize draw. Yes, yes, on oh, this team, they're finally getting it. <laughs> you can win a two night stay for you and a friend or lover in one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses. Okay, I'm gonna let you into a little secret, okay? My husband contacted me yesterday. He said he really liked the way that I, I read about this lucky prize draw. I'm gonna try it again, see if it works. Uniquely designed, these funky luxury retreats include fab things for a pampering stay, like hot tubs, saunas, cargo net day beds suspended above a stream beneath an oak canopy. <laughs> I can't, I, I just can't, I can't keep it up, I'm sorry. Sorry, dear husband. Uh, the tree houses are a perfect place to escape and get away from it all. You need to win tickets, though, to see uh, to see this. Um, uh, and the way that you do that is to uh, enter the lucky prize draw by going to the Reba Radio webpage on architect.com, fill in the form and put in the magic word. And that magic word is giraffe. Giraffe.
there is an, another uh, prize you can win, which is tickets to see the specials live. So, and just by entering, you get an A2 specially designed poster with 10 top tips for inclusion. It's so beautiful. The way it's folded is amazing. It's definitely worth entering just to get the poster. Full terms and conditions can be found in architecture.com. Broadcasting your inclusion journey online, 18th to the 26th of November. You're listening to Reba Radio. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramrup. I'm the Director of Inclusion here. And we're bringing you how many hours? 28, yes, 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything that you do. It's all rooted in the principle of CQ, cultural intelligence. We've been talking fear. We've been talking data. We've been talking discomfort. Now we're going to talk motivation. Motivation is so key to actually being successful at working and relating with others. Reba Radio with Marsha Remu. In case you forgot, which what you were listening to, it's, it's such a professional outfit. Uh, you knew exactly who you were listening to. This is day two and the final hour uh, today of Reba Radio. We're talking CQ Drive, which is your level of persistence and confidence when working and relating with those around you. Uh, just a reminder, everything that we talk about is about CQ. Now, Q stands for quotient. It's a measure as well as a skill. It's another way of saying cultural intelligence and the research has proved that in order to be successful at working with those who are different from you you need four capabilities CQ drive CQ knowledge CQ strategy and CQ action and Reba Radio is focusing on promoting diversity and inclusion within the architecture profession underpinned with these four themes the these four key themes. Who wrote this? These are four key themes of CQ. So today we've been looking at CQ Drive. Monday and Tuesday we'll look at CQ Knowledge. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday we'll look at CQ Strategy. And Friday we'll look at Action. Absolutely crucial foundational behavioural tool to move us all forward. And we'll be talking about motivation, intrinsically motivating yourself with some really, really key special people after hearing from Hamza. Hey guys, Hamza Sheikh here. I'm really looking forward to sharing my Reba Radio Hour with you guys, where I'm going to take you through a bit of a personal journey, share some of the songs I've selected, and boy are they varied. I've got Pakistani Western fusion music, I've got UK jazz rap, and there's even some classical Japanese music in there. Yeah, you're definitely not going to want to miss this, a super wide variety and a bit of an adventure. So make sure you tune in today at 5pm. Oh. I am feeling, I'm feeling the feels right now because we have got an absolutely brilliant, stellar group of people to talk to about motivation and digging deep and finding uh, what you need to find to persist and to be confident when 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 things maybe aren't so great and, and really then still excelling and, and getting the outcome that you need. Uh, first up, we have Majid Majid. He's a Somali British activist and politician who served as Lord Mayor of Sheffield a couple of years ago. You may well remember his appointment it was like everyone heard about it. it was all over the press all over the media um, because of all the firsts that he embodied when he got that role and a personal story that I hope that we'll hear from Tom Young amazing amazing athlete won gold medal in the men's 100 meters t38 event at the Tokyo Paralympics and Sammy Kinghorn multi gold medal winning wheelchair athlete. Welcome to you all to Reba Radio. Thanks so much uh, for joining me uh, to, to, to talk about this. If I can start with you, Majid Majid, um, do I always have to say your name twice or can I just call no, you Majid? Just Majid is fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Beatrice, Beatrice Garley. I wasn't quite sure. Um, okay, so like when, when you think about 
overcoming difficulty and overcoming you know that sometimes you know when, when life is tough what is what do you draw on when you're trying to overcome difficulty um i guess for me it's just also just knowing that it's and um, you can't do everything by yourself you know what i say like it's people like of course hard work is important we all kind of really need to work hard but hard work alone doesn't get you far enough like i'm thankful to like i mean my mother who made sacrifices friends who grounded me people of sheffield and yorkshire that void for me and just people that kind of just generally support me kind of thing so it's just um yeah it's just kind of just understanding that of course there's always and um, having to believe in myself first f- fundamentally kind of like because if no one like if i'm not if i don't believe in myself how do i expect other people to really believe in me and kind of get behind me as well that's a really, really good point. And, and Tom, believing in yourself when you're when you're at the start of that race, how much of that is important when you need to have dig deep and find the motivation to to push through what might be a difficult day? I think it's just really important, you know, to uh, always know that when you're on the line, that you're on there, you're on the track to win you know because if you think you're not going to win there's a good chance you won't win so it's just about knowing that your capabilities and that you're on the track for a reason and yes really just always believing in yourself is key to succeeding sammy um you weren't you haven't been using a wheelchair all your life uh, so this was quite a significant change for you um, in, when it ter- when we, we talk about motivation and, and thinking about, OK, major life changes and how to overcome them, how did you navigate what was quite a, a significant life change? Yeah, um, actually, I was only 14 um, when I had my accident. And um, I think for me, a lot of people were like, oh, gosh, you're so young. That must have been so difficult. But I believe that because I was only 14, it was that a little bit easier um, because I didn't have all the added extras that a lot of my patients that were, a lot of people that I was in hospital with that were adults had, you know, like how am I going to pay my mortgage? I'm going to be in hospital for six months, whereas I was 14. All I really had to worry about was I'm getting six months off school. I probably need to think about catching up at some point. Um, But, you know, I think for me, it was the hardest thing was the acceptance of that things are changing and I'm a little bit different and yeah that's obviously that's difficult at 14 because um everything you care about is very very superficial and I guess losing the use of your legs is a very superficial thing and you notice it quite a lot so yeah that was probably the hardest thing was just trying to accept and get over that how deep did you have to dig and maybe those around you to manage this life change um, for me, I think because um, I had nobody to blame but myself, my accident was completely my fault. I put myself in a position that I should never have done. Um, unfortunately, I did involve my, my father. So for him, that was horrific and it took a very long time for him to get over that um, because, of course, you never, ever want to hurt your daughter ever. And especially the condition I was in for the first few months was not something I'm sure my dad ever wanted to see me in. And for him trying to except how my life was going to change um until I found sport he was terrified he had no idea what my life was going to lead and for me I was so lucky I had friends and family that like they boosted me my friends were amazing because obviously there was times where I was just kind of like I just want to be around people that are the same as me I don't want to be around able-bodied people because I just I just I don't want to always drag them down that's how I felt my friends were constantly like no no you know, if there's a party in the top floor flat, we'll get you there. If there's a party in the middle of the field, we'll get you there. And they always made me feel really involved. And I think that was how I felt as integrated as possible. Sammy, do you mind sort of for context, just explaining a bit about your accident, what actually happened? Yeah, of course. Um, it was the 2nd December 2010, and it doesn't um, seem like that long ago at all. It genuinely seems like last year I can remember everything like it was yesterday. And um, I there was more snow than I'd ever seen before in my life my best friend was stuck at my house um which was great we missed our um, prelim exams because they were all cancelled because of snow which was also great I was having the best time of my life um helping my dad on the farm my dad's a farmer so 
incredibly hard all hours all around the clock and I, I was getting out and helping him which is something that I love and still say they still love to do um my dad was driving in a forklift and I started as an annoying 14 year old started to walk in front of him and just trying to put him off his job um and for some reason I don't know why I thought it'd be a good idea to jump onto park forklift something that I've never done before I was always taught that machinery has no mercy for human life and you do not touch it you don't go near it you don't climb on it and I decided to climb on it thinking that my dad had seen me and it became very clear very quickly that my dad hadn't and he um he crushed me with the bucket and which uh, yeah left me paralyzed from the waist down. So in terms of trying to, to manage all of those emotions and try to move forward with with, with your life there's quite there was quite a lot for you all to have to deal with. Yeah, there was, you know, obviously it took a long time to kind of, for me, it was, it was weird because I, um, I knew straight away that I couldn't walk and I knew that straight away I kind of, um, I guess I think the way I was brought up, you know, my mum and dad worked a lot and my dad was always there, but somewhere on the farm and, um, I learned quite young that anything that I do has repercussions. And so I was just kind of like, well, this is my fault. I need to deal with the repercussions. And I think people are always like, that's a very mature way to think of it. But that's just how I was brought up because I spent a lot of time um, just like in the house on my own or finding my dad on the farm. So, you know, if there was anything I'd done wrong, I had to learn about repercussion. And I just knew, I just kind of like, well, this is my fault. But I didn't realise that I was going to be, in, um, I'd never met anyone in a wheelchair. So I didn't actually realise that I was going to be in a wheelchair. I genuinely believed for the first three weeks that I was going to be stuck in bed forever which is ridiculous you know I should have known all about disability and what would happen and I should have I should have seen that more and I genuinely believe for the first three weeks that I was going to be stuck in bed for the rest of my life and I'd almost come to terms with that so the day that my wheelchair was brought to me like a smile on my face because for me that was so much better than being stuck in bed forever you mean I was like you mean I can get out of bed I can go around I can move around I can go and see my friends fine yeah what's the problem I just can't stand up and put one leg in front of the other um, and it you know I, I was I was I was quite strong about it all you know meeting loads of people in the hospital was totally fine um I loved meeting new people and it wasn't really until I got home and I remember the first time I actually cried and um, was probably about a year after my accident and by this time I'm, I'm coming up for 16 years old and we're going out to a party and I put a pair of heels on and my my ankles just like flopped to the side and it was the first time where I really realized that I was different. It was something that I couldn't do that my friends were doing so easily. Um, and I remember that was the first time I genuinely started crying and I was just like, this is so annoying. And then, you know, my friends got around me, we went shopping, we found a pair of like smaller heels and block heels. And then it was just kind of like, right, I can't do everything the same, but there's always a way around it. And I can, that, that's how kind of how I live my life now. I might not be able to do it the same way, but there will be a way mm. I can do it. And imagine um, there is something in that, that sort of taking personal responsibility and acknowledging um, your role to play when trying to do things differently. And, you know, your book, uh, The Art of Disruption, um, is, is behind me here on the Reba Bookshop where we're broadcasting from. And, and that sense of that taking personal responsibility for your own journey. Yeah, 100 percent. It's... Um... And as well, it's like, I guess, from our point of view as well, it's, it was, of course, taking responsibility, but it's also giving space to other people as well, basically, because it's, I'll be honest with you, like, in, in terms of my role and position, it wasn't like, I know as much as it is to be celebrated, like, the first person to do this, first person to do that, but it shouldn't, like, I shouldn't have been the first, in all honesty, like, especially in a city like Sheffield, as diverse as it is, I shouldn't have been the first person. So for me, it was also really important that, and I kind of support other people. I've kind of just got this saying where I kind of believe like we've got two hands, one to climb up with and the other to lift people up as we're climbing. So for me, I'd always kind of like um, mentor a group of 10 young people all the time, support other people to get elected in different positions in Sheffield City Council and stuff. So it was, yeah, just taking that responsibility and knowing that basically it's just, yeah, it's, it's great that basically you're taking on these role positions, but it's like, but what are you going to do with it kind of thing? And more importantly, how you actually go, how are you going to use this privilege that you've been given to actually have an actual impact? We are super lucky to be joined by Majid Majid, Tom Young and Sammy Kinghorn on the theme of CQ Drive, Intrinsic Motivation. 
We're taking a break from live programming for the weekend, but you can head, head over to Reba YouTube's channel to see the subtitled full videos of all our content, which will be up there as soon as we can possibly humanly manage it after broadcast. Uh, earlier, I was speaking to Makalonge and Eli Stathaki and Emma Weber about the use of measurement and data tracking to move people and organisations forward uh, with their EDI efforts. EDI, equity, diversity and inclusion. And certainly content worth catching up on because so much talk has been recently about that effective capture of data in our sector. And cultural intelligence is the capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. And this is the overarching theme of this radio station. It's the behavioural framework that allows us to consciously create those procedural changes to mitigate the influence of hidden bias. And research has proved, it's proved that in order to be successful at working with those who are different from us, we need to have these four key capabilities, which are drive, knowledge, strategy and action. And Reba Radio is focusing on promoting diversity and inclusion within the architecture profession underpinned by these uh, key themes. And CQ Drive, the motivational CQ, is uh, the level of a person's interest, persistence and confidence to function with those who are different from them. So being inherently motivated in yourself and curious and wanting to actually work and relate effectively with those who are different from you is a really key first step and we're looking for inspiration on how to do that uh, with people who all know very much about digging deep um, in order to perform in order to be their best and in in order to help others and that's Majid Majid Tom Young and Sammy Kinghorn Tom if I can come to you and when it comes to performance uh, on the track um, when when you're having a bad day uh, when you just don't feel like it when you're when you have to get up early to go to the track and it's still dark outside. Uh, how, how do you cope with that? <clears throat> I think, you know, in the past like year and a half with the pandemic, especially at the start, you know, when there was no tracks open, no gyms open, and we had to train on our own every day without our coach, without nobody there, having to, having to wake up, you know, and go out there and do your session was harder because Personally, I love training in my big group. So being by yourself and doing those long, tough, hard sessions were harder. So you just had to wake up really and you know and still try and and still try and enjoy it. Luckily, I still managed to, you know, love to love doing what I was doing, but sometimes it was, you know, difficult, you know, having to, you know, wake up, you know, and literally get out. Luckily, I live near a big field, so I could go and do my sessions and just as like just about as normal as I would have done as I would have as I would have to be back in on the track. But yeah, it was harder. But um, I just think it's all about, you know, just trying to stay motivated, you know, and knowing that Tokyo still was going to happen the following year. It's just about looking into the future and knowing that the thing you want to work towards is still going to happen. It's just going to take a bit longer. And um, I know quite a few athletes, you know, probably felt the same way I was feeling you know so it was normal and it was just about trying to overcome how you was feeling and still getting all of the sessions done for the future. So for you sort of having that long term or that future goal about what you could achieve uh, at Tokyo if you put in the work now was was a good motivator for you? Yes yeah, certainly because because of the we are Paralympians, we always like have a four year cycle. So even though that four year cycle got extended by a year, we still knew within that cycle, we'd still have the European champs, we'd still have the Paralympic Games in Tokyo. So it was just about looking at the calendar, putting everything for putting everything a year into the future and still trying to train to the best of our abilities. Luckily, the support we the support we still got was really good. So we could still, you know, speak to our coaches by the phone you know and we could record our sessions and we could view it back and look for it through video of course it's not the same of course but um, it's just it, last year it was just about finding ways to try and train to the best of your ability and then um, luckily when um, things got a bit better we could go back onto the track and train again but yeah those first few weeks 
were difficult for quite a few athletes, but um, I think so many people just found the best ways to overcome it, and um, it really helped our performance in Tokyo. Sammy, how, how did you overcome that that sense of, you know, uh, everything just being quite uncertain? I mean, that couldn't have helped very much when you're trying to focus on an ultimate goal of, of winning medals. Yeah, of course. Like Tom said, it was it was difficult when we didn't have, we weren't able to train with our training partners and we didn't have tracks. And um, yeah, it was a lot of, um, for me, rollers inside and doors and getting out on the roads when I can and when I had somebody that would able to, it was able to go on the bike with me. Um, but yeah, just like Tom, I guess it's, it's having, just looking into the future. Uh, for me, I, I get really nervous um, about racing. So I like to make sure that when I'm on that start line, I know that I am as best prepared as possible. Um, so the way I do that is, you know, when you wake up some mornings, it's raining, it's freezing and you don't really want to go outside. It's like, well, if I don't train today, all my other competitors are. So when I'm on that start line, I may, may as well take a step back and I don't want to take a step back. I want to line up alongside them, look along the line and know that I deserve to be there because I've trained just as hard as, as everyone else. And that always makes me feel a bit better. So that kind of makes me want to push that a little bit harder and uh, get up when it's freezing or when you don't really know what's lying ahead. Um, I just tell myself that everyone else is getting up today. And if I want to be be the best, then um, I have to get up and train. And, and I'm, yeah, like Tom says, I'm, I'm, we're lucky and, I love what I do and I can't believe that I get to do what I do every single day. And um, that makes it obviously so much easier as well to do it. Majid, I mean, we, we're talking about CQ drive and, and motivation in that, um, you know, you need to be inherently motivated to work and relate effectively with others. Um, but not everyone loves what they, the, the idea of doing that. I mean, do you have any, any tips really to, to motivate people to, to work and relate effectively with others and digging deep and finding it within themselves to have that curiosity and desire to, to be different? Yeah, I guess it's why a lot of people, in my opinion, just kind of just can't get themselves to do it, is a lot of people tend to focus on the what they need to do and how they need to do it, and not really focusing on the purpose or having that deeper purpose of like, why is it that they need to do what they do or they're doing what they're doing kind of thing. So for me, it's always just a case of trying to understand and have a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose of what, you, what you're doing, like why you're doing what you're doing. And as well, it's... Um, I don't know, for me, just the ways I kind of keep motivated is and um, having some sort of plan because it's, of course, having the vision, it's all really important and stuff, but without making an actual, I'm not, I'm, and I don't necessarily mean writing a plan in my head, I'm just actually just having some sort of concrete roadmap to achieving what it is that I was, that instantly keeps me motivated because it means that I can see each task as small bits rather than just trying to at times feeling a bit overwhelmed and everything, but also just having like stuff like having accountability partners and that can take the forms of having the friends, colleagues, could be a coach, whatever it is kind of, but just somebody, because it is always easier to achieve goals when you're working with somebody else or you're working as part of a team or you, you so our accountability partner, or whatever, but it's just when it's kind of, when you're doing it by yourself, that's why a lot of like entrepreneurs and self-employed people have, have a hard time actually trying to, motivate themselves because nobody's gonna say like hey why are you doing this like or why so it's just and uh, yeah working within a team is also i find really really important or just finding like-minded people even if you're not part of an actual team just being around or just engaging with people who are in the same situation is that can really understand the struggles that you're going through is is, is really really important uh, so, so far, we've got had amazing advice from these three people. Um, so finding the purpose of, of wanting to work and relate uh, effectively with others is definitely the one way. Breaking down tasks. So to do a little bit at a time. Um, focusing on long term goals uh, so that you can uh, uh, look at, you know, that's that's the reason why it's worthwhile and, and finding, you know, that purpose in those goals uh, and being with others and having that accountability. Uh, definitely ways to, to to motivate yourself and imagine just to, to come back to you you know your your personal story of 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 overcoming barriers share share a bit of that with us <laughs> uh, overcoming barriers is like it's sometimes i put my own barriers in place sometimes there's other people putting barriers <laughs> but it's like in, in anything in life when you're trying to really excel in something or you're trying to 
change your community, to change the world, or change yourself, or whatever. There's always going to be barriers, basically. Personally, for me, whether that be like resources, whether that be dealing with racism, whatever it is, it's like I've always basically had different. Even at times, it literally just could be. Um, even your own friends and family, like that people that mean well, but basically that don't understand what it is that you're trying to do or, or, or can put barriers in your way. Sometimes people just don't just don't like what it is that you're doing or just feel as if like, or people just don't like change. Like in terms of like a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment is people are just stuck in their own ways and stuck in traditions and they're just very fearful of stepping out of their comfort, comfort zone and challenge the status quo and be like, no, we know it's, it's always been done like this, but we need to do things a bit differently kind of things. And at, at times as well, like people just can be stuck in their own ways. Tradition, I always say like tradition is just peer pressure from dead people. Mm. And, and and it really is, but it's just about questioning those and kind of really having thick skin and really just, I think it's also just knowing yourself and um, allowing yourself to persevere. Mm, knowing yourself. I mean, Sammy, presumably to be uh, exceptional and, 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 and to, to achieve and, and to be able to, to overcome difficulty, you have to really know yourself. Would you say you, you really know yourself? Yeah, uh, I think I'm definitely starting to know. And I definitely think that it's something that you can keep getting to know yourself even more because you definitely change. You know, I, I would have said at 18, I knew myself, but I'm not the same as I was when I was 18 years old. So I definitely think that it takes experience to know yourself. Um, I think now, um, honestly, I remember when I was 18 and that you just worry so much about what people are thinking and everything like that. And I remember my mum always saying, you won't worry about that when you get older, but it's, it's so true. You know, you get older and you do start to become aware and start to become confident. And this is the person I am and this is the person I want to be. And you don't so much let the others, other people bother you or people that don't think you're doing the right thing or being the right person. Um, yeah, I definitely think that it's really important to, to know yourself and, know what your goals are and the person the kind of person you want to be and how you're going to reach them goals through being that kind of person we're talking cq drive motivation with majid majid tom young and sammy kinghorn yes uh, indeed uh, if you go to architecture.com and you click on the top right hand button join the riba uh, all the info that you need is there uh, if you're wondering about the music choices by the way we're breaking up the content with uh, well, i think dare I say it, some great tunes, uh, just to keep it all lively. And all the tracks are there for a reason, be, you know, inclusion messages in the lyrics or stories behind the artists from underrepresented groups and their allies or campaigns that they run or the love of the song itself from those discriminated against. And we every day have a special music hour between 5 and 6 p.m. today. Um, it's called My Soundtrack, by the way, and, and we have special guests. And today it's with Hamza Sheikh. He's one of our guests from earlier. He's an architectural podcaster. If you missed our chat with him, by the way, and the architects Paul Zara and Jason Boyle about fear, about getting it wrong and how to manage that fear, you can hear it all again after uh, our live uh, uh, broadcast today. And um, it's all on this link. We're talking now about how you can motivate yourself when things get tough. CQ Drive, it's uh, the first CQ capability. It's really, really crucial. It's um, can do you actually want to? Do you actually want to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you? And drawing on that sense of motivation that you can get to do other things, you can draw on that to move yourself forward with this journey as well. Um, and uh, talking to Majid, Majid, Tom Young and Sammy Kinghorn. Um, if I can ask you, Majid, uh, you motivate others. There's no doubt about it. You're very motivational. Um, how do you do that? What do you do to try to motivate others into action, whether it be in their communities or, or, or the environment or anything else? Right. I think first and foremost, it's um, leading by example. And for me, really, really kind of, because um, I find it difficult to be tell, like trying to inspire people or telling people how they should do things if I'm not doing it myself kind of thing. So it's leading by example is really, really important. But also really just kind of like just involving people from the get-go um, is really, really important. Like appreciating them, making them feel valued and that they can make a difference and they actually have got the ability. Because a lot of the times 
people might kind of not believe in themselves or kind of really doubt themselves or doubt their place or their ability to actually achieve something or to actually bring about whatever change that they're kind of looking for. So it's also kind of inspiring them, appreciating them, but also really just challenging them as well, I kind of find, because kind of soon to come to find out that we, we're all capable of more than that we actually think that we are, that, that we can basically. So it's just really kind of also challenging people, but also I find that it's building a relationship and knowing that person because everybody's different certain things and um, work on certain people so it's really important that and um, to motivate other people that you kind of have to know them that's a really really interesting and useful point because um one of the ways that i find particularly useful when trying to build cq drive with individuals is to understand what are their values and what are their strengths and to use those you know using sort of actual tools to identify what those things are and use those to try to push people forward to motivate them okay you want to work and relate effectively with others you say that your strength is personal responsibility how are you going to use that to take you forward or you say your value is making a difference in the world well how how can you use that particularly uh, as well and and sammy you you obviously found yourself in a, a very difficult situation where suddenly you did didn't have use of your legs um and presumably now that you're you're out there you know um winning medals that must be quite a great story to tell others yeah and it's something that i am um, i really enjoy doing is speaking to, to kids and to adults um in completely different ways kids just letting them ask the questions breaking down their bar barriers and telling them that you know nothing can stop you and trying to you know make them feel that you know to be yeah, i guess to motivate kids and to make them think that you know they're, they're that they're unstoppable because as a child you should feel like that um and then for adults it's again breaking down the barriers and getting them to understand that i can still do this and i can still do that and um for me i think i always try to show it as a um anything can happen you know take the opportunities enjoy your life do the things that you want to do don't just wait till tomorrow don't just wait till tomorrow because I'm sitting here living proof of like something you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So, you know, make sure that you're enjoying what you're doing. And, you know, my dad always, whenever I was little, um, me and my brother, he'd always, every day, my dad would say to us that life can be very long or life can be very short. So why would you want to spend any of that time doing something that you don't enjoy? And it's just, it's literally my dad would just be like, honestly, I don't care what you want to be when you're older. As long as you can wake up in the morning and you can say to me, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I'm working hard. Um, and yeah, I think that's really important. And I, yeah, I love being able to share my story and being able to tell people and being able for people just to ask me honestly anything they want to ask and hopefully understand. Um, and hopefully, yeah, be able to motivate them to, to, to do what they want to do. Tom, what about you, you know, in terms of bringing other people on, on a journey with you to, to try to understand how to be better? <laughs> Personally, I just, you know, just try and motivate people just in my every, just like in my everyday life, really, you know, so whether I'm like I'm speaking to people like online, whether I'm, you know, going to like um, meet up in person and hopefully just um, through people speaking to me, they can again ask me questions, you know, and just probably get to know me a bit better, to be fair, really. Certainly that sense of uh, that getting getting to know people seems to be a, a really key part of, of that. And, and when it comes to working and relating with those who are different from you, I think that might be a really key aspect to, to be able to embed a bit of um, CQ drive intrinsic motivation. Um, Majid, uh, when, when you're uh, thinking about, right, I've got I've i've got this big crowd <laughs> i've got a big event coming up uh, i i've got a i've got to inspire this group what sort of thought process goes through your mind in order to inspire others i think it's first of all just knowing and understanding the audience and that for me is is, is really really important and it's also just generally being really authentic and speaking from the heart because of course we can all speak in platitudes and kind of come prepared with do this do that kind of thing but i think nothing really beats just speaking honestly speaking authentically and just kind of really speaking and that's what and also just speaking from real life issues and not something so distant far away that people can't see themselves doing or kind of feeling that they would never be part of that kind of thing 
if you could give people one piece of, I want you all to think about this, one piece of advice to, you know, when, when things are tough, you know, they've, they, they've got, they're having real difficulty. So in, in, in my mind, you know, you've got to go and have a meeting with a group of people you just really don't like. You don't know why you don't like them, but you don't like them. How would you advise, I'm going to start with you, Majid. I'm asking this question really slowly so you have time to think. How would you advise them to really find that motivation in themselves so that they can have a great conversation, work through any kind of difficulty, discomfort that they get? Majid. Is this in relation to like meeting a group of people that just disagree with people that I don't like and knowing that I have to work with them? Yeah, to bless out that situation? exactly. It's, we're all going to encounter people that we don't like, right? It's family at times, friends, but, but, but you know, in honest, even with work, or whatever it is, if I'm going to room people which I just absolutely despise, I try to put that to a side as difficult as it can be and just really focus on what it is that I need to do and the bigger trying to like just focus on the bigger picture basically and even though which is when i'm engaging i'll just try and get all of us to kind of focus on the the main tasks that we all kind of share that because even 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 the people that i disagree with or whatever, there are shared commonalities that we both kind of want that we all want and it's kind of just really focusing on those kind of things that that we kind of share and that we're all trying to achieve rather than um the fact that we don't like each other because so and so said so and so about you kind of thing, but and it, it can't it, it really can be diff difficult, but it's um, yeah, just trying to focus on what matters. So that that idea of let's focus on the bigger picture here. What are we all trying to achieve? We have more in common than than breaks mm. us apart. Uh, to to quote Joe Cox, um, Sammy, <laughs> coming to you next. <laughs> yeah no I think Madge has pretty got it uh, I think that would be what I would do I'd probably try and go with the plan of what I want to say so I don't get distracted by anyone or don't get distracted by any other thoughts um what I need to say what I need to get across um and yeah I, I guess there's always something that you can relate with some someone um and I feel like you can just put put some things to the side and make sure that yeah whatever you're trying to achieve you do achieve and, and put your personal feelings to the side um yeah, I think that's probably the Can best. I just come in just, in just on top of what Samantha's kind of basically said. Also, I just think it's um, it's really, really important that you like before I would kind of go into a meeting or just meet people like that. I, I always think it's important to try and have an understanding, even though I might disagree with them, of where they're coming from, basically, where they're mm -hmm. rooted in, basically. Just so then when we are kind of discussing and talking, I'll be able to show a bit more empathy and more likely things will kind of like people's attitudes will kind of change along and stuff and it's also just knowing that nobody's got monopoly on truth or the best ideas kind of thing and it's just also understanding that we're all fallible but fundamentally we all are trying to get behind what it's but also as well it's like the more like research or better understanding i have of the other people the more i'd have better arguments the more i can prepare yeah. um, of what i would say or i'd kind of or how i can strategize kind of thing that's a really mm -hmm. key part of being culturally intelligent is that piece before the action is see key strategy and we'll have more on that next week. So finally, Tom, you know, if, if you had to to face a, a, a room of, of of those people you don't really, really like, maybe you'd been taking the mickey out of you, something like that. I mean, how how would you how would you motivate yourself to to go and do that? I think I've got um I think my attitude was, would just be, you know, about to try, you know, and just, um, if you can enjoy it, enjoy it. And if, and just, if you unfortunately can't enjoy it, still try and do it to the best of your ability. I think Magic and Sammy really explained their points well and I'll, re and I'll correct, you know, and yeah, I just think to also just try, you know, and um, enjoy it if you can. And if you, yeah, if you unfortunately can't enjoy it, just try your best to do it to the best of your capability. Well, certainly those points about planning, 
thinking about you know there, there is more in common than than takes us uh, brings us apart is is definitely a key part of being able to work and relate effectively with people who are different from you it's been amazing to have Majid Majid Tom Young and Sammy Kinghorn thank you so much to you uh, for joining us um, I am going to take the brave step of stepping away from the uh, Reba Radio main desk uh, to take a walk around uh, the bookshop here at 66 Portland Place. And one of the amazing things about this, I understand it's uh, the foremost architectural bookshop in the world, according to the note written on the £20 note that was handed to me by the bookshop uh, a manager here, Pete. Um, and it's got some amazing, amazing stuff. So over here, I spotted a little bit earlier, there's a book called Feminist City by Leslie Kern, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. And on Monday, I think I said that we've got this extraordinary panel of Roma Agrawal, uh, Farshid Musavi, and uh, Melody Lung from Zaha um, uh, Hadid. And uh, certainly uh, Farshid had this uh, really great stuff to say about inclusive spaces. And so uh, I might have a little pre-read of Feminist City by Leslie Kern. And over here is uh, Roma's book, how was that built? The stories behind awesome structures, which is also available here at the bookshop. So uh, all the authors um, and their books and the themes of diversity and inclusion, all available here at the bookshop 66 Portland Place. It's not just amazing, beautiful picture books around architecture. Plus, you have all those policies and guidance books as well. But if you come into the bookshop, you can get your Christmas cards. I've said the C word. I'm so sorry. If you're not thinking about the C word until December, um, they are still a beautiful because they're gorgeous, gorgeous images with all these lovely little snow drops all over the, the cards, which make them look amazing. So you can come in for your Christmas cards as well. Plus they have uh, amazing postcards because who who doesn't like to get something written these days? Like, when's the last time you sent a beautiful handwritten note across to someone about, you know, anything, anything? So come in here, grab a postcard, and what you can do is write a little note to someone uh, about anything. And then they'll be no surprise. So who knew that uh, the bookshop could do all that for you? I'm going to make my way back across now to my desk put on my put on my hands because got to keep it real tell you everything that's going on and we have got some fabulous prizes to give away let me tell you uh, about some of those <laughs> Take a chance. Enter the Reba Radio Lucky Prize Draw. Enter the Reba Radio Lucky Prize Draw. Win a two-night stay for you and a friend or lover in one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses, uniquely designed. These funky luxury retreats include fab things for a pampering stay like hot tub saunas, a cargo net daybed. Who doesn't want all of those things? They're perfect, perfect to get away from it all. And you can win tickets to see the specials live. Their show next July in Dublin, it sold out ages ago, but we've managed to secure two tickets for our lucky winners, plus a night stay at a hotel of your choice in Dublin, up to the value of 200 pounds. Oh yes, yeah, two days in, the team have got it, they've got it. Uh, Saturday the 2nd of July 2022, uh, Trinity College Dublin. To enter the draw, go to the Reba Radio webpage on architecture.com and just fill in the form. You need a magic word and the magic word you need is giraffe giraffe that's what you need to do so go to architecture.com fill in the form and put in the magic word the winners will be announced live during the last broadcast on friday the 26th of november plus plus each entry will receive a limited edition booklet that folds out in a new, unique way to reveal a striking and beautifully designed a2 poster with 10 top tips 10 top tips for inclusion 
an absolute must for the office wall. Full terms and conditions can be found on architecture.com. You need to be a member to, to enter, so just watch out for that and maybe consider entering uh, a, a membership anyway. That just about wraps things up for CQ Drive Day. You've heard from Robin Schlenger, Jim Rooney, Phineas Harper, Ellie Stathaki, uh, Mac Alonge, Hamza Sheikh, Jason Boyle, Paul Zara, Majid Majid, Tom Young, and Sammy Kinghorn, all about different elements of CQ Drive. And you can listen to all of that programming again here now on this link as we repeat the content and soon all of it will be accurately subtitled and up on the Reba YouTube channel uh, the Reba radio playlist join us on Monday as we deep dive into CQ knowledge women the gender pay gap as well as talking about race a proper a list of contributors you wouldn't want to miss it thank you for listening to day two of Reba radio I'm Marsha Ramroot director of inclusion and I'll be with you again on Monday from nine o'clock on Reba Radio. You've been listening to Reba Radio. Real, inclusive, brilliant action.